ready? Let's go. Welcome, you're now tuned into another amazing edition of Sonya on Air. I am your host, Sonya Hudson Payne, and I have another great celebrity guest for you. But before we get started, let me just tell you a little bit more about Sonya on Air and what I aim to do. I am just a woman who grew up in Brooklyn, and what I love to do is watch celebrities and figure out their pivotal moments and their milestones, not only for me, but also for you. We want to unpack, like I said, those pivotal moments and those milestones. So do me a favor. Make sure that you subscribe to all Sonya On Air streaming platforms on YouTube, iHeartRadio, iTunes, Spotify, Amazon Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Buzzsprout. I have so many celebrity interviews for you, teachable moments. Like I said, unpacking their pivotal moments and their milestones. But guess what? excited. I have another great celebrity for you today. I have singer and one fourth founding member of the iconic, iconic <laughs> female all group Invoke Dawn Robinson. Hey. Hi, <laughs> Hi Sonia. Sonia, how are you? I'm fine. I'm fine. You know, I just want to ask you a quick personal question. I'm, I'm asking this question to everyone. I am now yes. suffering from seasonal allergies. This is my first time. So my mm -hmm. eyes are on fire. I'm looking for any type of remedy until I can go see my doctor. So do you know anything about seasonal allergies? Well, I don't because I don't claim allergies on my body. I just don't. Um, but and also, you can go to YouTube and look for like I, I'm into alternative medicine. Me too. I don't go to doctors. Yeah, I don't go to doctors for stuff unless it's something that's so severe. I have to get like, what is this that I have so I can go home and research it so I can find some kind of um, alternative medicine for it, holistic medicine. Um, yeah. So I would go on YouTube because there's a plethora of information there, and everybody talks about what they've done themselves to actually heal themselves. So you can start there before you go to your doctor and maybe um, some kind of eye wash, probably some kind of, because I think allergies start with from within. So it's probably our diet, most likely that's affecting us. And then the, you know, the, the uh, elements af affect us as well when people have allergies. I'm thinking it's the elements and I'm just like you. I like holistic remedies. Yeah. Like I put bags on my eyes every single morning. I'm flushing them tea with- bags. Yes, chamomile. <laughs> <laughs> chamomile tea bags are really soothing, so that'll help you a whole lot. Chamomile. It yeah. helps tremendously, tremendously. You know, I try yeah. those things before I go to my doctor. And even when she tries to prescribe something, I'm like, okay, have you considered something else before you try yeah. prescribing another pill? I don't yeah. believe in that at all. But I, I'm really excited to have you um, I'm join. I'm excited to be here. I'm so sorry I couldn't find you. And then I forgot you said streaming. I, I just totally forgot that quick. I've had so many interviews and everybody's a different platform. So I'm like, where am I today? Am I on Zoom? Am I on Instagram Live? Um, so yeah, I'm so sorry for that. But thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. I'm still trying to figure out, you know, like, okay, what day is today? So I totally understand. <laughs> So, you know, just a tip, how do you organize your days? Because I don't have a grasp on the days at all. What do you do to organize? You gotta utilize your cell phone because our cell phones have and all kinds of fun. So I'm literally, I have about another 45, every day I do a request to do interviews. So I, I'm, I'm organizing them myself and I'm booking myself. So I have to look at, I put it on my, um, on my laptop, I have a desk. On my desktop, I have uh, virtual um, sticky notes. And so I put a lot of stuff on there as well. And then I have a calendar. Now I'm going to switch everything over to my calendar. Because wow. I literally do not. Yeah, it's crazy what's happening. Usually I have a publicist to do this, but I can't afford a publicist right now. So I am I am my publicist. <laughs> booking all of these um, incredible um incredible uh, interviews. Like It's really great to have these conversations with people. Yeah, so, you know, the whole face of, you know, COVID-19 and quarantining, I think it's been a blessing in disguise, especially for me. Um, I don't like to look at this as a negative. Um, I think it's right. really allowed us to really grow internally exactly. and really figure some things out. It made yes. us sit down. Sonia, it 
I showed people when it first hit in March, April, I was showing people photos that they have of Los Angeles. And because people were home, like literally home and locked in their homes for a while, um, the skyline over Los Angeles, when you come into LA from any, from Vegas or from um, San Diego or from anywhere, you can see the skyline of the city and it's brown. It's yeah. like so much smog and, and nastiness in the air. And it was literally clean. Like it was 1908 or something, you know, before the industrial revolution happened or in the early 1800s, I should say. So um, it's because our impact was not there <clears throat> as, as, our, as people. Um, we weren't driving and over, over consu consuming and um, over polluting the air. So yeah. in the oceans, they said are cleaner too. They had um, fish that were coming closer to, not to shore per se, but closer inland because there was no human interaction. There was no yeah. inter human interruption, you know? So I'm like, you know what? Most of the stuff that we get and we bring home, yeah, if you got to bring home food, that's essential. But a lot of times we're just out being busy and getting stuff that we really don't need. We overcome, pollute, like I said. So um, it was to see that the city had clean, it had been clean. The air, like Los Angeles is never <laughs> five in the morning dirty it's like you know smog everywhere so it is changing the COVID impacted us um in a way that was more positive than negative if you allow yourself to be afraid that you get COVID, i'm like you guys you got to get out of your head and stop watching the news so much because the news is going to paint the picture of fear that's what they want us to be afraid and i'm like you got to put your faith in god you cannot rely on the president because he's not going to only he's not he's going to do what is in his agenda not yes. necessarily for the people. So I'm like, you guys got to stop looking to a human being to fix it for us and look to the universe or God or whatever you call your higher power, you know? Yeah. That's so yeah. true. You know, just going back to the smog and the pollution in LA, it was the same thing here in New York City. I live. Uh, oh my gosh, my city. I, that, okay. I love LA. I love LA. I love London. <laughs> But New York is number one for me. Yeah, it's because my family, that's my dad grew up there, was raised, born and raised there. And so we were two hours away in Connecticut, New London. And we were always for summers and all this stuff in New York. So now you're in New York. That's my city. Yeah, I, I, I live, you know, um, near the Brooklyn Manhattan Bridges. So I'm able to see the New York skyline right out of my yes. window. I'm looking at it now. And in April, May, June, the city just looked so different. It looked cleaner. You know, I could yes. see clear into Manhattan. And I said, you know what? Nature really forced us to say, I got to get back to the beauty of exactly. nature. Exactly. But, you know, we have to take care of our cities. We only have one planet. And I keep yeah. telling people, even I don't have children, but I know that for their future, we have to make sure this planet is clean. Yeah. <clears throat> we have to take care of it. It's like we over pollute too. So it's like, how much trash? Oh my gosh. We, they don't even, I think that for a while they were sending our trash to China and they wow. using their landfills over there because they weren't as full as ours. I mean, we over pollute like crazy. We over buy, we over consume, like I said. So um, I try not to make a negative impact on the planet. Yeah. So with the food that I eat, um, I make sure that what I have, I eat it all. I, I try not to waste as much as possible. Um, and then I always, you know, from, from a child, our parents always tell us, um, there are kids in China that are starving, you know, over in China and over in Vietnam. And so that has always been in our minds to eat everything on your plate, but don't put so much on the plate in the first place. Right. If you yeah. want more, you can always go back and get more, but don't, you know, it, we overeat. <laughs> so all of this stuff, COVID made us, first of all, it made us in touch with each other as a whole. So we connected on the internet much more as human beings. Mm -hmm. um, parents that do have children were teaching their kids at home, homeschooling, and they were learning like, oh my gosh, you have this kind of math? You know what I mean? You have, you have to do this every day in class. I didn't realize that your homework was so hard or yeah. that work was so difficult. Um, yeah, so we were, we were learning a lot more about ourselves as human beings. Sitting down at the table at home or just sitting in the living room and eating together because Parents were out of work, so they were home with their kids instead of like most times parents are still at work when their kids are latchkey kids um, feeding themselves at home by themselves and doing right. their homework by themselves without their parents home. Now it's like parents and kids were at home together. So it connected us in a way that was really beautiful. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. On the end of that spectrum, I don't have a small child. My daughter is a young adult, but I'm yeah. actually um, sitting next to her when she's doing remote learning for college. Right. And you know, it is such an experience for me to participate in her young adulthood going through college. Wow. Oh my I'm God. So mother and father didn't have that experience with me because I was a different exactly. type of child. <laughs> right, right, exactly. No, me either. But it's wonderful. See, again, you're learning something through your daughter and watching what she does to see her work. Like you would have never known that most likely if you were still working like you were before. Before COVID, yeah. you wouldn't have known that. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm watching her class. Like, do you usually, yeah. you know, cell phone? Are you usually on your cell phone while you're listening to your professor? Like, what is that about? Are you really? Exactly. In Yes, we're really that's having so these great, Sonia. Really, that's wonderful. That's, and it's a connection for you guys. Like you, you bonded because of that in a different way. Yes, you know? yes. yes. Yeah. But let's jump into you, this amazing singer. You know the Thank founder you. of Vogue. You know, yes. I read there that you and Maxine, another founding member of In Vogue, were friends. And you learned about the audition together. So can you just talk a little bit about that story? Because I am intrigued about your audition well, we process. we weren't friends. Actually, I went to get my hair done at a hair salon in Oakland, California. And she happened to be working there doing hair. She was braiding hair. Um, wow. Maxine is a an exquisite braider. When I tell you, if you want the shape of a flower in your hair, if you want a heart, if you want a box like box braids, she is she can do anything you want. She's that type of yeah. Oh, she's so incredibly creative. She's amazing and gifted. I would say gifted. She's not just a braider. You know what I mean? She braids and shapes and, and she can do whatever you want. Um, so Maxine was braiding hair and the owner of the salon was like, oh, so Miss Dawn is telling me that she can sing. So I have someone over here, Maxine. And she turned around. She said, yeah, Jeffrey. And he said, um, this young lady is saying that she can sing. You can sing too. So you guys sing something together. So wow. that's how it was. We didn't really know each other until that moment. And then I never saw her again until the audition maybe a year later. <clears throat> so when she walked into the audition, I was like, you look familiar. And she said, you do too. Wow. We tried to figure out. She's smiling and she was nervous. So um, Denny and Tommy came over and they introduced her to me. And we all met Cindy. And because Cindy was there first. I was there second. And okay. um, so I had already met Cindy, but Maxine, when she walked in, um, our producer, who became our producer, came over and introduced Maxine to us. And he met her his, his, his self because he didn't know her either. And then he introduced her to Cindy. Um, and then we started trying to sing things together. But in the meantime, we were still like, where do I know you from? Oh, my God, you look familiar. Right. And we found out that we had known each other from, um, yeah, from the hair salon. That's where we kind of like. Like, oh my God, you did hair. That's right. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so we knew. Tell you something. There's all these amazing stories that goes behind the scenes in hair salons. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right? I love, that story the business. I love that story because it, it, it's once again a testimony to how the universe always finds a way to connect people at the Isn't right Isn't that point. amazing? Isn't yeah. that amazing, Sonia? Yeah, you're right. You're amazing. right. Like, come on. The yeah. fact that I, there's so many, you're talking about Oakland, Oakland California, it's predominantly a, a black um, city. It's much like Atlanta, you know what I mean? So um, it's mixed. It has a lot of white people as well, and Asians people, and um, Latinas and Latinos, but predominantly is a black city. So the fact that I could have gone to any hair salon, but you went into and that I one. Went the, you know what I mean? That is, that's the universe as well. That's God, too. Wow. So, and also, the, she's from the East Coast as well. She's from New Jersey, Patterson, New Jersey. Okay. And I'm from Connecticut and grew, grew up in New York. So, you know, we have East Coast mentality for a lot of things as far as survival skills and all that stuff. Like, it moves fast, you know what I mean? And New Jersey is the same way. So is Connecticut. So um, yeah. we just have similar, when I talk to her family and I'm around her sisters, I'm like, oh, my God, I feel like I'm around family because they like Dawn. Dawn and everybody on the East Coast calls me Don. I'm like, what is Don? I'm not Don. Don is a man's name, you know. So, but when I, I make my family from the East Coast say my name over and over again, like say it again, Dawn, Dawn, Dawn. You know, it's almost like Dawn. It's almost like D. Yeah, exactly. D W A N as opposed to D A W N. Dawn. 
<laughs> and so much. So Maxine, yeah, we have this uh, this kinship, this family. Um, it feels like family with her all the time. Nice, nice. Yeah. So talk about that audition process. How long was the audition process? Did you feel intimidated? Did you feel like you already won? <laughs> it was it was very intimidating, I think, for all of us. Um, Cindy was probably the only one who had ever gone to an audition. Um, but I think mostly her auditions were for acting because she was an actor before she was really, that was her passion, was to be an actress, to, to do films. And um to have an acting career and so i don't think maxine may have gone to auditions as well for plays because she was um so cindy was a local bay area bay area favorite she she tried out for miss um california she was miss oakland um she was she won miss she had to audition for that she had to, to be in the pageant you know what i mean um um, so she had, I would say she had competition in a different way than she would in an audition. So in a pageant, you, you know what I mean? It's like, you can, you can join the pageant if you have enough money, but to right. actually win, that's what I mean by that. Um, and I had never really competed. I was in Miss Jabberwock, uh, which was an Oakland teenage. I was a teenager. I was still in high school. Um, but you know, I just, it was like a talent show more than anything. Um, and I'm trying to think. If there were no other, I was gonna go. I was gonna join Talented Teens International. Was a was a um, kind of like a competition for young teenagers. But my mom never got me to New York to do it. We we were she had income to get me there because I would always, my dad. But for Christmas, we always had prepared for that. And in this in this instance, I think it was like January or February was after the holidays, and I couldn't get there. Mom was like, I can't do it. So. I really never had a competition or an audition to go to. So this was new for pretty much all of us. We were all nervous, but um, we were supportive of each other. Uh, Terry wasn't there at the audition until later that night because she had bad weather coming out of Houston. Texas is where she was coming from. So um, she didn't get there until later, but we learned, we, we learned the background parts that day and we laid down the background parts uh, we sang everything until uh, we were still trying to wait for Terry just to buy time. And then at about eight, Denny, uh, Denzel Foster turned to us and said, um, you guys, who's going to volunteer to go first? We might as well start the process to wait for while we're waiting for Terry. And I was mm -hmm. like, oh, my God. And I had been all day long telling my sister, please take me home. Let's go. Let's just leave. And she was like, no, you're going to stay. You came here. You had me here all day long. And no, we're not leaving. And my sister's younger than me, but she was pregnant and married at the time. Okay. And I got on her nerves a little bit too much. <laughs> and it was probably about, I don't know, 6.30 or so. And I said it one last time to her, please, just let's go. Like, why are we here? I'm not good enough for this. And she was like, and she yelled at me, Sonia. She was like, Dawn, you have been yelling at me, uh, asking me all day to take you home and in front of everybody. Like, the room was full of people. You've been asking me to take you home all day long. You asked to be at this audition. You've been here all day long. You sang the background parts on the song. I'm not taking you home. And I was like, okay. <laughs> because she embarrassed me in front of everybody. But she was just tired of it. She was She knew that I was capable of getting into the group. She knew that yeah. what this audition, I was going to kill it. So wow. she's like, no. It was only um, six women there that day. So it was Maxine. I'm sorry, five. Maxine, Cindy, Terry, myself, and then a girl named Jordana. And okay. Jordana kind of had this nasty Oakland attitude. Um, she came in at, at a certain point. She was fine at first. We were all cool. And um, she actually didn't tell Maxine about the audition either. And she lived with Maxine. She was her roommate. Wow. Yeah, right? she was her roommate. And Maxine was like, she saw her getting dressed and she said, where are you going? Where are you going? What, what's going on with you? Like, why are you like, getting dressed and makeup on and all that? She said, where are you going? And she said, oh, I have an audition. But she didn't tell Maxine, like, let's go. Like, you want to go too. And uh, a friend of Maxine's who ended up ma managing Maxine, his name is Ken, and he's the one. I think he told her, Jordana about it, and then he also told Maxine. But Jordana didn't tell Maxine about it, so that was kind of weird. Yeah. Um, and then we got to the audition and yeah, Maxine volunteered to go first. I was like, no, I am not. And Maxine killed it. She was so amazing, Sonia. I was like, no, 
I'm not going. After, I'm not singing after her. I am not doing this. And uh, Denny, when Maxine came out, we were clapping and applauding for her, like high fiving her. She was amazing. And then um, Denny turned. To, he 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 had his back to us. There was a couch behind him, up against the wall, and he had a roller chair, like one of those chairs on wheels. Uh -huh. And he was sitting at the council, you know, in the studio. There's like all these buttons and and knobs and stuff like that. And he was sitting there at the, so. After we talked to Maxine about how nervous she was and all this stuff, um, Denny turned to us and he said, okay, Dawn, you're next. And I was like, you gave her a choice. And he said, yeah, but if I give you a choice to, to volunteer or not, you're not going to volunteer. He's uh, like, so go ahead, go in the room and you sing and you do your thing. And I was like, okay. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. So again, we had learned the song that day. So okay. we were reading the lyrics. I don't even know how Maxine did it, but we were reading the lyrics. And um, uh, you, anytime you're learning something for the first time, whether it's a speech or, you know, you, you got to speak at someone's wedding and you give a toast to someone, you know, or you got to speak in church or um, at someone's uh, party or whatever, you're nervous because you don't know what you have to say, you know? And so we had just learned the song that day. The what song was it? It was called Waiting on You. Waiting on You is on our first album and it's a bonus track on the on the Born to Sing album. Okay. So we had we sang the backgrounds, but we still didn't know the leads that well. And he had written all the lyrics down by, by hand. So I'm standing in the studio, I have on the headphones, and there were glass doors in the studio. Um, so when you walk in, you're supposed to close the sliding glass door and then go sing you know, go to the microphone. And they had these uh, partitions that were up in front of us so that we wouldn't be able to be seen by the people behind the glass doors. Um, so I closed the glass door. I went behind the partition. I put on the headphones and I'm looking at the lyrics. And he said, I could hear him over the loudspeaker. He said, now they can't see me. He said, Dawn, are you ready? And I was like, oh, yeah, I think so. Um, so he starts the song and I bombed. I completely bombed the first one. No. He's like, and he came over the speaker and he said, well, I think he could do better. I said, I know I'm so nervous. He said, well, just, you know, close your eyes. I said, but I can't because I don't know the lyrics. I, I, I got to read the lyrics. I can't close my eyes. So he, he let me try it again. And I think we had three tries is what it was. Maxine doesn't remember that, but I thought we had three tries. The second, it wasn't great, but I was better than the first. And he said, well... He said, that was pretty good. He could do better, though. But he said, hold on. Your sister wants to come in there with you. <laughs> yes! yes! Sonia! Oh, my God. What does she want? What does she want? Why is she? What? What? And so I stepped out. I could hear the sliding glass door open, and I, I put the headphones around my neck. And I was like, Dana, what? What do you want? And I stepped out of the partition. She's like, Dawn. She, she opened the door and then she closed it. She said, Dawn, you can do better than this. I know you're better than this. You know, you can sing your butt off and you're not today. And I was like, Dana, I, I don't mean to be terrible, but I don't know. She's like, Dawn. That until she was getting ready to walk out. And um, she's like, but you can do better. And I'm like, Dana, I'm trying. Leave, get out. And she's like, no. Um, I'm gonna tell mom if you don't sing this song and you don't do you bomb this audition today, I'm gonna tell mom and you're like, Dana, get out, get out. Oh my God, if you don't get out. I'm so like, I was embarrassed because I know that they can hear me on the speakers overhead. Oh my God. And so she finds, she's like, okay, I'll leave, but I'm gonna tell, just put the lyrics on the side because that's where you're having problems. I'm like, okay, fine, get out. And, <laughs> I went back behind the partition. I took my headphones and I put them on my head and I took the lyrics and I put them to the side because I was like, I'm not really good at ad-libbing on the spot. I have to know what I'm going to sing before I actually sing it. Sometimes things will come to my head. Um, but for the most part, if I don't know the lyrics, what the heck am I going to sing? I can't make up words. Right. This is a song about, um, I can't keep wasting my time waiting on you to come home. Um, you know what I mean? And so I, I can't make those lyrics up. Like, what do I say? So I kind of remembered what I had to say. I remembered the melody of what the words were. And I just clicked. When Dennis said, are you ready? I was like, yeah, I think so. 
and the music started and I was just, I closed my eyes and that was it. Uh, something took over. I know that it was God. I know that it was God. I'm not a religious person, but I know that God exists and I feel him. I feel God in my spirit, him, her, whatever it is, the universe. I felt that come together. It was like the lights went on. It was almost like I knew the song already. I knew the lyrics. And I can wow. hear when I listen to the song, even because it ended up putting my actual audition on the song, on the album, on Born to Sing album. So when you hear the song, I can hear the trepidation that I'm kind of guessing what I have to say next and I'm messing up little parts. But for the most part, it is amazing that I sang that good at an audition and that I wasn't so nervous that I completely bombed again. Like I still to this day think, wow, when you have, when you have that moment of truth and you have to get that job or, um, I don't know, most times it happens in auditions and most people don't get to go to an audition. So that, but that moment of truth, if you're in court and you have to speak up for yourself about something, maybe child support or, um, getting, you know, uh, I don't know, if you in a, when you're in a crunch and you have to stand up and speak for yourself or do something that you're not used to doing, mm -hmm. that was my moment. That was wow. my moment, and I got that audition. And they were like, when I came out of the my sister, by the way, I heard the door open and close, but I was behind the partition, and I thought she left out, but she didn't leave. She was in there with me the whole time, so she could hear me singing. Wow. And she was like, she, when I stepped out, Danny said, "Oh my God!" And I could hear everybody clapping. And he said, "Come on out." And I was like, okay. And I took the headphones and I put them down and I stepped out and my sister grabbed me. <laughs> she was in the room with me and she's like, oh my God, you sounded so good and blah, 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 blah. And we walked out of that studio and they were screaming. It was like, it was like a show. It was like, everybody was clapping. The, the, the engineer, Debbie and Tommy, Cindy, Maxine, um, uh, Jordana, Terry still wasn't there yet. And everybody was like, wow. You said that you couldn't do this and you were nervous and you were all of this. I was like, I was. But that <laughs> moment, that moment of truth, when you ask God for it and you like take a deep breath, yeah, you jump off that ledge and it's like you you'll soar. You know what yeah. I mean? You just gotta take the risk. And that's I wanna tell people anytime I get a chance, and I'm gonna put this in my book as well. Anytime you think you don't have what it takes, like you know, you're sitting there and you're like in that, I don't know, um, in, in an interview. A lot of times it happens in an interview and you have to get that job. You know, when you ask God for it, it'll be there for you. When you believe in yourself, it'll be there for you. You know what I yeah. mean? If it's meant to yeah. be, you'll get it. Yeah. You know, as you were talking, you know, everything just resonated with me, but it was such a teachable moment because what I heard was from the onset of you meeting Maxine in the, the hair salon, uh -huh. the universe always, you know, prepare your place for you. Yes, and it's yes. okay for you to meet the universe at the place where you're supposed to meet the universe at. So it was, so it was so weird how your sister was in the room. See, the universe knew. The universe exactly. was already for you to just show up. Exactly. Well, Sonia, even more than that, even before we got to the audition, when, um, okay, so uh, the way that I even found out about the audition is God. There is no other way that I can explain it. There's nothing else. There's no, oh, well, you know, the chances are, no, no, no. I was at um, a summer jam every year. I'm gonna move this closer to me because I feel far away. Every year, um, summer jam, Oakland, California. Well, actually it was Martinez. Martinez, California is right outside of Oakland. So it was about, about 45 minute drive from Oakland. Uh, we would go to summer jam, my friend and I, high school. Um, so this year, it was two years after high school, my mom was on my back all the time about what are you going to do with your life? You're not going to go to college and so you got to get a skill because you're not going to live with me forever. You know, and I'm like, mom, I'm only 20 years old. You know, I'm 19. I'm 18. Come on, give me a break. So we were at the Summer Jam concert and this guy was, um, we were 10 seats from 10 rows from the stage. We would always get like VIP seats and we got up to go. It was like the cover girls were coming on or or cvb was leaving or coming on and um in the meantime in between they had to change sets so the band was coming on and we could see them changing those you know and we were like go, let's go to the bathroom it was really a cue for let's go find like look at cute guys you know check out <laughs> boys check out boys while we you know walking around 
And we we ended up going to the restroom. We went and got some popcorn, came back. Oh, sorry. So before we, when we got to the top of our section, this guy was standing there. I didn't see him. There was so many people. You're talking about 25,000, 22 to 25,000 people, right? It's a huge <laughs> concert, outdoor concert. And he, somebody said, um, excuse me. And we both turned around and he said, are you a model? And I said, and I was like, whatever. I just kind of played him shade, right? We went to the restroom, went and got popcorn, came back. He was still standing there, Sonia. He said, um, excuse me. Now I was facing him this time so I could see him still standing. I'm like, oh my God, what does he want now? And he said, are you a singer? Oh my God. Yes, 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 yes. Now we can talk because now you... I didn't care if he was trying to pick up on me at all, but the fact that he said, are you a singer was like, whoa, how did you know that? You know, and the fact that um, my friend was actually a model, he didn't ask her though. Mm. He asked me if, yes, isn't that something? Cause she would have talked to him for an hour. I stood there and talked to him for an hour. Um, wow. And the fact that, cause he would have talked to her and never really got the conversation with me about singing at all. Cause they would have talked about modeling or whatever. But right. he told me later, he said, it wasn't that you were, so much a model but you had a good look to you and i i thought you know my friend is doing an audition and they they want a girl in the group and you can sing and see, he said so i want to come i want you to come to my house tomorrow so i can hear you sing and i was like i am not coming to your house uh, -uh no no i don't know you but you can come to my mom's because my parents i live with my parents still and you can come to their house and hear me sing and he came to their house the next day and heard me and was like i yeah you can you can audition because he wanted to know if I actually had talent. Right, of course. Of course. Yes. So it was it was so God. Like that yeah. that moment. Come on. Like again, predominantly women at that concert too, by the way. Um, you know, because it was Stevie B, Cover Girl, Sweet Sensation. It was all eight, you know what I mean? So there weren't a lot of guys, I would say predominantly women at that concert. Mm -hmm. So he could have talked to anybody. He could have been in any section throughout that whole huge arena. It was in an outdoor arena. So you got people sitting on the grassy area having picnics and food, you know, from home. And he could have talked to anyone. He, he could have left after I was so rude to him <laughs> and played him off like, whatever. He could right. have left that area and went and talked to someone else who was actually a singer as well. Yeah, you know, so yeah. I know that it was God. Those moments are the universe talking to me. It was meant to be that I was at that audition that day. It was that. Yeah, and you know, most people would, you know, not receive that message or that lesson. Um, they uh -huh. wouldn't have, you know, the space or you the universe to meet them. You know, I'm a firm believer. Exactly. Like when you believe something, and you haven't communicated it to anyone, but some random person will come and say, "Listen, do you do this or?" Okay. I see that that is God or the universe actually, you know, trying to get you to step into your truth and understand. Exactly, your truth. Sonia. Yes. So that's amazing. But going into the audition and even securing um, uh, a position in, in Vogue, what was your, your dream about that? Did you know that in Vogue was going to be as huge as it no. is? No, my God. None of us knew that. You know, the record company, um, they give you a budget to record, but when you're brand new, they don't know if you're going to work either. They don't know if you're going to succeed or fail. So they don't really put a lot of money into the, the artists when they're brand new um, because they don't know if, it, if it's going to work or not. So the budget for a wardrobe for doing Hold On was minuscule. Uh, the budget um, for, for the video Hold On for um, the budget for us to do our album cover, cover photo shoot was really low it was minuscule um for hold on i ended up bringing my black dress from home uh mm -hmm. the black dresses that are in the video i brought my black dress from home yeah. and isn't that something because they said that you know we we saw the clothes that they had the night before and i was like oh i you know so they had these black dresses and i was like well i'll just bring mine you know because you already had three dresses here um I'm, actually they had four but i didn't like all of the dresses so i was like well i'll just bring mine just in case so i ended up wearing my black dress that i used to go clubbing in so when i do my book i'm actually writing my book right now i'm gonna put right. that picture because i have a photo of me and my my friend uh, kim who was actually at the, at the audition with me 
Uh -huh. uh, I'm sorry. She was at the concert when that guy said, excuse me, are you a model? That was my friend Kim. And, and I had on that black dress. <laughs> we were at a club. This wow. is like San Francisco. Yeah, we were at a club. And you still um, have the black dress. that little black dress. What'd you say? Do you still have the little black dress? Oh, of course. Of course. I kept it. Yes. It became famous <laughs> after that because like, every <laughs> woman should have a little black dress in their wardrobe, you know? Yes. 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 You know, speaking about that song, Hold On, you know, once you mentioned that song, I immediately went back to when I heard that song for the first time. And yes. then, you know, we were singing it, you know, amongst our friends, but I knew it was huge because we went into clubs and they were playing that song. Yes. We're in New York, you know, home of hip hop and, and Biggie and Jay Z. But when exactly. Hold On on in the club, it really oh made Oh my gosh, wow. Stop that whatever. Amazing. <laughs> Wait, and so did they play the acapella part too? Yes. That's wow. how I the hit. When it didn't oh even have to it, but they were playing the acapella version of it and people were still dancing on the dance floor in New York City. Wow. That you could ever see dancing to just words. That's oh how- Oh my gosh, exactly. That is amazing. That really is amazing. I know that when that, um, when that you, you, you know, all four of our, yeah, all four of our harmonies, that's when everybody's like, oh my God, my song is coming on. <laughs> because it's like the beat kicks in right after that. Oh my gosh. And I've been on the dance floor and it's like, I guess the, the DJ knows that I'm in the house. So they're like, we're gonna play Dawn Robinson's songs, and I'm like, oh my god, you, and you're just ready. It's like you get ready for that part because you know it's getting ready to happen. Oh my gosh, it was brilliant that Denny and Tommy, when we recorded, hold on, it was two different pieces, two different parts. So the the acapella, you that when that part was separate from the beat, right? And when we came back to the studio, we recorded the rest of the album. We came back to the studio, a different studio, because we had to master and mix the album, mix and master the album, mm -hmm. and sequence the album so that you have, you know, one through one through twelve. Right. What's going to be number one, number two, number three? Then you turn the album over, number five, number six, and you know what I mean. So um, we we hadn't heard "Hold On" in a while, the acapella and the beat. We hadn't heard them in a while. So we came to the studio that day to sequence the album, mix, mix master and sequence the album. They had put those two pieces together. I was like, oh my God, this is terrible. I, I thought it was bad. I thought it was awful. <laughs> because we were so used to, when we, when we heard the song last, it was two separate parts. And why did they put them together? And oh my God, this is terrible. And it was, it was what it was meant to be. They knew innately that those two pieces together like that, bam, it was going to be a hit instantly. Instantly. Yeah. Instant. Yeah. So <laughs> they were right. I'm glad they didn't listen to us. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm trying to adjust my um No problem. You know, when you were um, singing just a little bit of the acapella version, you yeah. have to because as a as a young girl, you can't you couldn't tell me that I wasn't a fifth <laughs> member. <laughs> yes, exactly. I love it. I love it. We have so many. You are you're an honorary member too, Sonia. You are. Say, say, no, say it again. I'm a I'm a what? Uh, <laughs> an honorary member. You are an honorary I'm, member I'm, of Invoke. Yes. <laughs> I love it. You are the chemistry a little bit because you know you all really didn't know each other now you're auditioning now you're in this group in vogue catapulted into this success nationally and internationally what was the chemistry like it was amazing at first we were really you know we you start to get to know each other's uh um personalities as you're recording uh -huh. and so that's where we really we bonded at the at the audition, but we really bonded as we got to know each other and got in the studio. And so we started to see that Cindy was like, um, she talks real nasal, she talks like this, Don, everything is a night nasal. And we would call her the butter girl because she was like the girl next door. She was all American. Her mom is white, her dad is black. So she's this mix um, and she would pick at food. She, 
like she'll go over, she'll eat all the vegetables, all the fruit. Cindy is a very healthy, conscious, health conscious person. She does not. So if she does a potato chip, she does a potato chip. Oh no. Sorry, like one. <laughs> she does not go back for seconds. She does like when they say on Lay's, you can you can you can't just eat just one. No, Cindy can. She's extremely disciplined that way. Oh my God. And so she'd literally eat, and I'm like, here's and I'm holding the bag, and she's like, no, 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 I'm good. Like, oh my God, she's so disciplined. So we call her the butter girl. Maxine is the hippie. So Maxine would smoke her weed in her dress in her um in her hotel room. <laughs> Um, she's an old soul, so she didn't want to be bothered with me. Me and Terry were too silly for her. You know what I mean? We would laugh at everything, and she's like, "I just woke up. <laughs> I just woke up. Can you guys please, like, really? I mean, I'm like, whatever. Why are you so moody? Whatever. We're happy. We're happy. And right. I lived with her. Um, so Maxine had two other roommates, Jordana, like I said, and a woman named um, uh. Oh my gosh, I can't remember her name now, but she's beautiful, tall. She's like six six foot tall or five ten, with no heels on. You know, mm. what I mean? she's like a gorgeous woman. She's in Native American and black, so her hair was to her butt. I mean, beautiful. She should have been a model. Uh -huh. um, and so she lived with her too, and she had just moved out before the audition. So Maxine had an empty room, and I moved in there. And then after the audition, um, she's like. I moved in after the audition and then Jordana moved out as well because she felt like, why am I here? I'm not in the group. And then Terry moved in and took her room. So um, Maxine's moods were always like, shut up, be quiet, it's too early. Just, <laughs> you guys are too happy. And I'm like, why can't you be happy? Life is good. We're in a group called In Vogue. Like we didn't even have a name yet, but we're in a group. We're getting ready to be stars. Like, why aren't you happy? She was, uh -huh. you know, moody, moody, moody woman. Um, but we used to always make fun of her and laugh anyway. And then Terry and I were the most alike and we're the closest in age. I'm the youngest. Terry's next to me in age, two years older than me. And then Cindy and Terry are the, Cindy and Maxine are the same age. Um, so yeah, we were like sisters, you know, we were like the kid sisters that shut up, you guys be quiet type of thing. And they call me the rebel because I'm feisty. I speak up for things. I don't just sit there and take anything. Like you're not gonna just talk to me crazy. What? Excuse me? I got my hand on my hip all the time. You know what I mean? And then Terry is hilarious. Terry, I always told her, you missed your calling. You really? should be a comedian. Terry is funny. Oh, my God. Oh. Wow. Oh my, because Terry does not, she's not afraid to laugh at herself and make faces. She's just, Terry's hilarious. The girl is funny as heck. Oh, my God. Even the last time we saw each other last year, we did a, um, a charity for our uh, the woman that signed us to Atlantic Records, Sylvia Roan. Mm -hmm. And Terry was there, and she w we hadn't seen each other in ten years, and we were right back laughing like it was day one, like we hadn't missed a beat. You know what I mean? It was like, oh my god, you were still so silly, just cracking us up. We I was like, Terry, I can't laugh anymore. My throat hurts. Oh my god, stop. We gotta sing. Cut it out. Oh my god. Because when you when you laugh too much, you push pressure on your vocal cords, and it okay. makes abrasion, and you sound hoarse because you're laughing and ah, cracking up, screaming at Terry. Yeah, she's funny, um, but we would call her the nun, so because she would wear clothes from, she was always covered from the neck down. Like Terry didn't show any skin, any T, any A, no cleavage, no nothing. Like that's just Terry. Um, and she's real prim and proper because she's a Southern gal from you know from Houston. Um, so we would call her the butter, the, uh, the nun. She was the nun. So Maxine was the hippie. Cindy was the, uh, the butter girl. Um, American butter girl. I was feisty. Um, was the, yeah. Nice, nice. So that was early on. I know sometimes, you know, in, in just talking to countless different entertainers and celebrities, sometimes the industry kind of step in. And kind of change. Yes. Yes. Navigate. Yeah. You know, people's personalities. So, was there sure. any time where the industry kind of changed your group's members' personalities where you kind of looked at each other like, who is this person? Exactly. Well, the personalities, and when you look in hindsight, when I look in hindsight, um, they were always kind of like that. Meaning, Terry had, a, she was a little bit sneaky. Um, and there were things that I was like, wait a minute. So 
we had all agreed that we were not making enough money on our records. We were only making two pennies a record per girl, two cents for each of us, a piece. And at this point, we were like, I said, you guys, we have done, you know, two, really three albums, um, but two full albums. So it was Born to Sing, um, Funky Divas, and then we did a Runaway Love, which had a brand new song on it, which was Runaway Love. But it was a remix of all the other songs that we had. Um, and so I was like, I kept saying to Maxine, we got to renegotiate. Let's talk to the other girls. And Maxine was like, yeah, you're right. So we all agreed. All four of us were like, okay, we're not going to go in the studio and sing anything else until they renegotiate our contract. Because we went in the first album. Okay. You don't get very much of a budget at first. So you're happy to just get a little bit of an advance. You're grateful for that. But on the second album, after you go platinum on the first album, you're supposed to tear up that old contract and go in and renegotiate. And we mm -hmm. never did. So on the second album, we went in and started recording under the same terms as the first album. And I was like, you guys, this is not okay. Something's wrong with this picture. I didn't quite know what was wrong because we had never been in that position before. We didn't know what it was to renegotiate. We didn't even know the term renegotiate right. because we had never been there. So, um, so Maxine, I guess, uh, talked to one of our producers and he was like, no, don't renegotiate. Everything's fine. Because for them, it was fine. Right. Um, so the four of us agreed that we were not going to go in the studio and sing anything until they give us better terms. Terry ended up in the studio and mm -hmm. we called her while she was there. And we were like, why are you at the studio? We agreed that we were not going to do this. Now, Terry was involved with our producer, so they had a relationship. And she felt like she didn't agree with what we wanted to do. Um, and she was like, well, I, I don't agree with you guys, so go ahead and make a decision without me. And we were like, we can't make a decision without you, Terry, because we didn't sign a contract as three members. We signed as four. So if we go back to the label right now and say, well, Terry's not with us, <laughs> you know what I mean? And we're going to renegotiate our contract anyway. They would have been like, um, no, all four or nothing because, you know, they signed a contract with us. That, so they were not going to hear what we had to say. Um, because we didn't have all four members. And so we couldn't take a stand together because we were not together. It was three over here and one over here. Let me just interject, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm a believer, you know, you never shouldn't sleep in the same place and you never, That's you right. know, mix business and pleasure. So when you mentioned that, Terry was dating the producer. I'm like, okay, that's a huge conflict of interest there. Exactly. A recipe for exactly. But where were the lawyers and your managers where you didn't have to speak on your own behalf, but you had an entity that spoke on behalf for you? What were your managers? Well, the, lawyers, the lawyers can only say so much, but without Terry there, accountable. Gotcha. They, so they can't speak for Terry if she's not there. So they can't just speak for the three of us without Terry either. So that's a very good question. But yeah. Um, if it's not all four, we sign a contract. This is a major label that we sign a contract with. So this is not like, oh, well, okay, you know, we're a small label, independent label. So Terry not being here doesn't really affect anything. No, we sign four members. We have to talk to four members and, re and represent four members. So um, not only that, <laughs> I'm thinking about it now, but the record company offered Terry a solo album at that very moment because they knew that we were trying to renegotiate. So it was kind of like, okay, if we have Terry over here by herself, the other three can't do anything without her. So it was divide and conquer. And they knew that. But you let's know, put a, let's put a wedge between, I'm sorry, I'm just thinking as I go along though, but we put a wedge between Terry over here and all the other three over here. So that's going to make them, these three have to sit down and wait for Terry to do her solo album. Mm. And if that's the case, they can't ne renegotiate their contract without Terry. I'm sorry, it's all coming together a little bit different than a little bit more. Now I'm understanding it was because I said at first it was just Denny and Tommy dividing Terry from us, but it was really Denny and Tommy with the label dividing Terry and having her over there because Terry was dating Denny. Like I said, that was her, his girl. Um, and instead of her saying, you know what, I, Denny, we got a cool thing going, like what we got in the bed or in the bedroom is our thing and that's cool. But right. I still have to stand with my girls. And he should have said the same thing. And maybe he did. And she just didn't listen. Right. You never know what he was telling her. You know what I mean? What was your question? I'm sorry. Can you remember? I'm just, you know, I'm still a fan. You know, just. Of course. My 
optics. My optics, as you're saying that, thinking about when I saw the group kind of go their separate ways, as a fan, it always kind of looked like they were kind of making her into the lead breakout singer anyway. So, yeah, you think so? Yeah. Yeah. Because really? I sang lead on the biggest hit, though, so I don't see where they could have. Uh, like uh, when, you know, when she did her so you mean when she did her solo album? Even before that, the way it was like oh. camera time, it was the the verses. It just seemed as if you all weren't given the same the, the same level of wow. echo. It really did wow. seem that Oh my goodness, that's crazy. I'm telling you, as and you know, and even when I announced, you know, to my fans, to not yeah. my fans, to my friends that you were coming on the show, and we, mm -hmm. you know, just had you know sidebar conversations. They were like, you know what? We saw how they were, you know, trying to make um, either Cindy or Terry, you know, the breakout. But we oh, always wow. all dawn. That's the biggest feedback that I got preparing for this conversation. That people what? really saw you, and I was like, you know what? I have to tell her this because I don't oh think. Oh my that she gosh, Sonny, that this. is amazing. We saw this, you know. I'm you know, so you know, grateful. Everything, but you yeah, know, we yeah. we saw you um it just seemed as if there were entities just trying to not provide the equity but your presence was so strong that it was undeniable oh so my gosh man, 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 man. wow the, the breakup with the group where you were all negotiating your contract is that what happened well, I mean I couldn't see what you see now I see it in hindsight as you're talking about it that maybe they were trying to set up Terry for a solo thing. It wouldn't make sense to me. If you have a successful, we were bigger. So Denny and Tommy were in a group called Timex Social Club. They were in another group called um, Club Nouveau. Another group called Club Nouveau, yeah. So situation number nine, jealousy. Like they had all those hits, um, Lean On Me. Mm -hmm. um, and then, um, then they had Tony, Tony, Tony. They had signed them when they first came out. That's who they were on their production company. Um, I guess. Now that I think about it, they may not have. They may have just had a deal with the major label and they signed that artist, but not necessarily on their production uh, a production deal. So I don't know how that went, but they had Tony, Tony, Tony. Um, and I was asking Raphael, did Denny treat you guys a certain way when you guys, and he was like, what do you mean? And I said, did he tell you guys like to shut the fuck up when you were in the studio or go the fuck home or... Did he dictate to you guys the way he dictated to us? He was like, first of all, he would have gotten this. He didn't talk to us that way. We were men, grown men. Don't talk to me like this. And I was right. like, well, we were grown women too, but he talked to us like that. Terry was always okay with being talked to like that because that was her man. And I guess he told her behind the scenes. Um, I talk to you guys like this all the time, but I really don't mean it about you. I'm just talking to them like that, but I can't single you out because you're my girl. Um, mm -hmm. Now that I look in hindsight though, I think that maybe they were setting her up. I mean, it wouldn't make sense because they had such huge success within Vogue. It, you know what I mean? Why destroy something that is you a household word now? You had other artists and you were in other groups before, like I said, Club Nouveau and all that, but we didn't know Denzel Foster, Thomas Miguel were the way that they did with us. So I can't imagine, I don't understand why they would do that. Um, but it didn't work. It happened. I've seen this story happen so many times when it comes to wow. females in the industry and also females who are in a all female group. The way that they are treated, disrespected, they are yes. pitted against each other. They look yes. at one female in the group and they say, okay, well, you know, we're tired of all these four female personalities because to them it can be a little bit catty, even though it's yeah. not. It's not. And we see them select one and then put them in the, in the limelight and then they disregard the rest. We've yeah. seen recipe time You're and right. time. You're absolutely right. I've seen it a lot. But think about the guy groups too. When I got in and uh, Lucy Pearl, I asked Raphael and um, Ali, I was like, did you guys get along? You know, and I knew Raphael already since I was, you know, a kid. We were both 16 years old and he was in my band. So I knew him. And I knew him and Dwayne didn't always get along. <clears throat> I knew um, Tim, the drummer for uh, um, Tony, Tony, Tony. They were cousins. That's their cousin. And I knew mm -hmm. that they didn't always get along either. So 
when they say women are catty and all that stuff, guys can be the same way. Oh, yes. They, they disagree with each other. In fact, they go fisticuffs with each other. So they're worse. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They can be a lot worse. They're bitches when it comes to each other a lot of times. So um, I wasn't having it when I was in Lucy Pearl and being treated a certain way. But I'll go back to In Vogue. But I asked, I asked him, you know, how did that happen? Like, how did that? And he was like, no, we didn't get along at all. But you don't hear the comments about men not getting along the way you do with women. Oh, she's a bitch. She's a troublemaker. She's she's a problem. She's a, a whistleblower. That's what yes. they called me when I was in the group. And I was like, yeah, I am. Because En Vogue is not making money. Two cents of record is a travesty. Someone needs yeah. to be arrested for the kind of deal that we have. Yeah. It was, like I said, it was okay for our first album because they didn't know if we were going to win or lose. I didn't know if we were going to succeed or fail. So they're not going to invest a lot of money and time into right. a boat. But after that first album, baby, we, come on, we needed that. We deserve yeah. that. Give us what we deserve. I always say this too. If you take care of an artist, once we're successful, we can't go out and get nine to fives. Right. So you are our bread and butter. You're who we rely on all the time. And, yeah. and we're yeah. still selling records. Each album got better and better and better and better and better. So right. take care of the artist. The artist will take care of you because everybody will get paid at that point. Mm -hmm. And within our contract, we also had a, um, a solo right for each of us to do a solo album. So it wasn't like so far fetched for us to do a solo record yet. I just think it was too soon for Terry to do her solo album. That was wow. divide and conquer though. Just renegotiate our contract and give us what we want. So you don't have to put Terry in the studio. You don't have so to put Dawn in the studio. They didn't want to renegotiate the contract. So what happened where we no longer saw you and Maxine in the group? What happened? Well, so they came to Terry to do a solo album. Like I said, we had agreed that we were not going to do anything until they renegotiate our contract. When they found that out, they came to Terry and said, will you do a solo album? So instead of it being our album, Terry went in and recorded what would have been, I guess, our third or fourth album. Um, I think it would have been the EB4 album, which I was happy about because it was a terrible, I didn't like her album. I'm not being mean. I'm just telling the truth. I have an opinion yeah. and I didn't like her album. Um, I liked her single, whatever, wherever you are. I thought it was a great song, was really pretty. But for a first song coming off of an album, you should do an up tempo. You don't do a ballad first. It works. It works sometimes. Uh, Vision of Love was good for Mariah Carey. It was a little bit right. faster than Terry's song though, but yeah, it worked. Um, but I, I think that she recorded what would have been our fourth album. And let me see, EV3. Yeah, EV3, let me see. So Born to Sing, Funky Divas, Runaway Love. Yeah, and then um, EV4. EV, so EV4, it I don't think we would have named it EV4, but it became EV3. Mm -hmm. um, just because I was out of the group. So what happened was the the record company came to Terry, hey, do you wanna do a solo album? So divide and conquer. That means right. that all three of us are over here, Terry's over here, like I said, and it would cause confusion as it would shut us down and renegotiate. We're quiet now. Cause mm -hmm. Terry's over here doing a solo album, so we have to be quiet. Um, in the meantime, Cindy Maxine and I were trying to talk about what do we do right now? And I was like, we need to go in and talk to the record company. You guys have taken Terry to do a solo album because it was the same record company. It was our label. Wow. Yeah. So that's why wow. we were like, Terry, why are you in the studio? Why are you recording? We've made an agreement with each other that we were not going to go in and record anything. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't agree with you guys. And, I'm, you know, me and Denny have our thing over here. So... I'm like, what What does your thing have to do with us? You're leaving us high and dry. We're over here yeah. by ourselves while you're over here doing your thing. That's not fair. First of right. all, and it's not what we agreed on. Right. We talked about, we we made it up in our minds that we were going to wait. We are going to hold, you know, what do they say? Um, stand our ground and cross our arms and wait until they renegotiate right. for better terms. We have right. attorneys. We had an attorney, I should say. Um, but with Terry over there, it messed us up. So the record company came to me after Terry was done with her album, was out touring. They came to me and said, seven months later, they were like, okay, Dawn, um, do you want to do a solo? And I was like, me and Cindy and Maxine can't make up our minds what we want to do. So yes, because I'm going to lose my house if I don't. 
Right. What I regret is not telling Maxine and Cindy, hey, this is what the record company is offering me. This is what I'm going to do. That I regret that to this day because I wasn't honest with them. Um, and in the meantime, we supported Terry. We went to her show in L.A. We supported her. Um, she, there's a place in L.A. called uh, the Pantages Theater. Beautiful theater. Yeah. It's been around since Jesus was a baby. <laughs> and it's old, but it's beautiful. And she did her first show there before she launched her tour. Um, mm -hmm. She had a single out, like I said, called Whatever You Are, Wherever You Are. Uh, she did. They gave her money for a video. They gave her a video. Wow. Tour support, all of that. And we supported her. When the record company came to me to do a, an album, I said yes. Maybe two months in, I did a song called Healing. I let the record company heal it. Sylvia Rome loved it. Um, she said, okay, well, here's a little bit more money for your recording budget. And then about a month after that, she pulled the plug on me. She called me and said, Dawn, I got to pull the plug on your project. We're getting ready to go in and do another In Vogue album. And I said, to hell you are. Mm -hmm. I said, I will do the En Vogue album, but you believed in Terry's solo album, but you're not believing, you love healing. You know what I mean? My, my, my one recorded and she's like, yeah, I do. And I think it's a great song, but, but um my you know the higher ups um she was a high position in her label as well but the above her they were telling her that they needed an album from in vogue and she's mm -hmm. like oh, okay wow um so don't we got to pull the plug on your record we'll get back to you at some point and i was like no you won't let me go as a solo album uh, artist and i will stay within vogue but let me go uh, my solo rights are over here. i want to go i will stay within vogue mm -hmm. solo artist someplace else so um she said, okay, we agreed on that. And then we got in the studio. We were already in the studio recording the En Vogue album anyway. So I was doing my solo album and the En Vogue album at the same time. Wow. And when it came to, which is why that's how I did Born, I mean, um, Don't Let Go. Um, I was on that whole album, that whole EB3 album. I was on the whole thing. You can hear me, the whole album, you can hear my vocals. They were supposed to be off, but I can hear me. And then they admitted it later. Yeah, we didn't. Even Babyface told me it was difficult for him to take me off my parts off of wherever, whatever. The song called Whatever, Whatever You Do, Whatever You Think. I look in your eyes. You don't know. It, so you can hear me on there. Uh -huh. And um, so, yeah, so they kicked me out. Um, Sylvia came to Los Angeles and we met in Terry's room. And that famous meeting, I can see it like it was yesterday. And I've been talking about it so much, it feels like it was yesterday. But sure. the girls were, um, everybody was there before me. I'm always late to meetings. So I got there maybe about a half hour after everybody else. And they were already talking about, so we can't have any hidden agendas in this group. Um, we're doing this En Vogue album. I was like, but we already, we're, all, we're almost done with the album. What do you mean hidden agendas? Mm -hmm. Well, you have a solo album, Dawn. I said, yeah, but Sylvia, you know that because you signed me right? and you signed Terry. Terry did a solo album too. What, what makes her different? What's different about that? And Terry turned to me and she said, it just is Dawn. It's just different. It just is really. So it's like you asking your mom for something and she says, well, I, I you, can I go with my friends to hang out? And, you, and she says, no. And you say, why? It's because I said so. Right. Right. That felt like my mom was talking to me. I was like, what? It just is like, why? Right. Yeah, and this is what I don't understand to this day. Cindy and Terry were sitting there, Cindy Maxine as well, I should say. And when Terry said that, Cindy should have said, wait a minute. Terry Maxine should have said, ah, uh -uh, no, Dawn's right. What is different about that, Terry? Right. What is so different? Because you did a solo album on your own. You did your thing. You got an advance. You left us high and dry. What is different about that? Like, I don't understand. And to this day, I don't understand. Well, I, I, you know, just listening and from what I could tell you, you know, just hindsight from what I saw as a fan back then, it just you really seems it. apparent that people in her ear. She had enough courage to even say that to you because she knew that exactly. she had in the background that was going to fully support her, but her album. album but, your album but, but sitting there saying that after the fact, your album didn't succeed. If you were Beyonce coming out of the group and doing a huge album like that, or Justin Timberlake or a Bieber, or um, Justin Timberlake, I should say, because he was in a group and he had a huge. So if you're a solo artist that did a huge album and you won successfully, you were successful with your solo album, I'd be like, okay, 
well, yeah, it is different, Terry. But no, you didn't succeed. You didn't win. Your album didn't sell. But so, some people are still giving passes, even when they don't sell those record numbers. They have yeah. such a backing by these higher ups that they can fall down, fall down. And we, you know, as listeners, as viewers, we're watching like, why do wow. they keep getting coming out with albums when the record sales were horrible before it's about who's exactly. behind the scenes backing these individuals that right. we don't wow oh my god exactly well to me if i'm the record company and i'm the producers again when sylvia told me dawn we're going to pull you out of the studio and we're going to start the en vogue album i would have been like whatever dawn needs because she should have been like, okay, I did promise Dawn that I would do her solo album as well. Just like it's, I promised Terry, I did Terry's album. I didn't follow through on yours, Dawn, but I'm going to give you the utmost attention after this En Vogue album. I'll do that. Because mm -hmm. I owe you. Mm -hmm. I owe you that much. You know what I mean? I, I promised you a solo album, and you're absolutely right. Um, I did do Terry's album. And I apologize that we have to get back in the studio for En Vogue. I apologize for that. But... We're gonna mm -hmm. give you the full attention once this En Vogue album is done. If she would have done that, I would have been like, okay, you know what? At least you're apologizing to me and you understand how serious I am about doing a solo project because each of us had a solo right within our contract anyway. Mm -hmm. It was there in the very beginning and the very first contract we ever, in the only contract we ever signed um, in, in 1989 before En Vogue came out, we signed that contract. So within the contract, we had a solo right to do that. It wasn't so far-fetched. What was far-fetched was for us to do our solo albums right away. We weren't, we were solidified in the world. The planet knew who we were, but we still had so much to do before right. our solo albums should have, you know, so they should have never approached Terry for one and they never should have approach, approached me. If they would have taken care of us financially and renegotiated our contract, like I said, after that first album, we yeah. would have been together to this day. You know what I mean? It's like, and it's okay to go solo and do other things and come back and mm -hmm. go out. You know what I mean? It's like the only person I can think of is Beyonce. She's done it a couple of times with Destiny's Child. So, you know, that would have been okay for us to do. Um, but I think it was too soon for us to do solo albums. And the, the material on Terry's album wasn't great. It just wasn't great. So she didn't have the success that she thought she was going to have. No, that again to me, you're talking about the universe talking. That was karma. Yeah. That was karma. Denny and Tommy, our producers, they failed on her album. With us, it was always a win win. Within Vogue, it was always like everything was great with us. Success, success, success. And here it is, you do Terry solo album and it flopped. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, yeah, it made them all look bad. It made Sylvia Rome look bad. So that's why she was like, Dawn, I'm sorry, but we're looking at the numbers from Terry's album and we got to pull you out of the studio. It's like, no, you put out Healing, the he the single that I have, Healing, I mean, it's a beautiful song. I'm hitting Minnie Ripperton notes. It's like, it would have been the talk of the town because it was, a, it was a sound that the fans were not used to me singing. Like I'm hitting, literally hitting Minnie Ripperton notes, like Mariah Carey notes, those whistle notes. So, and at the time the the world wasn't like it is now of course but at the time we were going through stuff i think it was like after rodney king and all that stuff so it was like healing yeah we need healing and it was a beautiful it's a beautiful song i still have it um yeah. but yeah she heard it and she was like oh my god sylvia Rohn, she loved it i played it for maxine she cried cried wow. because it was that kind of yeah it's heartfelt it's beautiful um so I want to circle back to to numbers yeah. As you mentioned that, you know, multi-million dollar platinum selling group, but you were just making two cents off of every single album. How are you living? Because to us, you were all living large. What was your lifestyle like? It was, I was living in an apartment, ground floor apartment. I had a beautiful apartment, but it had 11 windows. My mom came over one day when I first moved in, I was still unpacking and she was like, one, two, she counted all the windows through my apartment. In my bedroom, I had four or five windows alone. It was like four on one window and I think another one on the left. And this is too many windows for a girl to be living downstairs and you're a star, like you're a celebrity, you need to be. So she said, call your landlord and have him put a um, put locks on the windows 
Yeah. So, but it was a cute apartment. I was paying what, 600 a month or something like that back then. Um, this is 1991. And, um, it was rough for us because we didn't, if we didn't tour, we wouldn't have had money at all. Like we weren't getting paid. We still had our little advance. Um, our advance was 5,000 up front and then 5,000 after the first album was, um, was done, which was yeah. fine because we were brand new. That was it. But we were brand new. So we didn't care. It was like a lot of money for us. $10,000. Come on a piece. Oh my God. I've never seen anything like that. But on the second album, we got the same exact advance. Are you kidding me? Yeah. Our, our second album, we should have had a million dollars, literally a million dollar check for us each on the second album. A million. Easy. Um, so, yeah, it was rough because had we not toured, like I said, our manager came home with more money than all four of us put together. How does that happen? How does that happen? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it just didn't make any sense. We were not doing the kind of business or the kind of sales that we had. We were not doing the business that showed that proved that. And in, in other words, our numbers were bigger than the money we were being paid. And I, I just was like, you guys, I can't take this anymore. Not no wow. more. So, so, so when they came to me in that room, like I said, in Terry's hotel room, it was mm -hmm. eight years later, Terry, Cindy, I'm sorry. Sylvia comes to us and says, Seven years, I'm sorry, seven years in. She's like, okay, so we did Born to Sing, we did Funky Divas, we did Runaway Love, and we did, and now we're working on that fourth album, which became EB3. We did Terry's solo album, we started Dawn's solo album, and now we can't have any hidden agendas in this, in this. And I'm like, what are you talking? That's why I said, you did Terry's solo album, what are you talking about? I, I, my solo album is not affecting En Vogue at all. Right. Not at all. The girls didn't even know I had a solo album with Sylvia Rohn, a solo deal with Sylvia Rohn until they called me one day and they're like, Dawn, we found out that you, Cindy and Terry called me, Cindy and Maxine, um, that you're in the studio and Sylvia put you. And I was like, yeah, I'm doing a solo album. And because it's not affecting in vogue, we're in the studio recording that whole album, mm -hmm. Right Direction, uh, where, whatever, the song that we did with Babyface, um, um, too Gone Too Long with Diane Warren. Um, we had done, we were doing that whole album. We were almost done recording it. That's why when we got to that meeting, I thought it was creative. Mm -hmm. What is gonna be the first single for the record? What are you gonna look like this time? What is gonna be the wardrobe for you guys for the album cover? Who are you gonna get to, to shoot the album cover this time, uh, photo shoot? That's what I thought it was gonna be. And they tell me, oh no, we can't have any hidden agendas. I'm like, I don't, I don't. I'm in the studio recording my solo album, but I'm also at the studio with you guys every single day. Right. So I'm what I'm doing over here has no effect on En Vogue's album, on the EB3 album. Um, and which is why, again, I'm on that whole album. Sorry, I'm trying to go through it in my mind. But yeah, that's why I'm all over that album because I was still recording with them. Right. So I where is it? No. Where's the conflict of interest? Where's my conflict of interest over here doing my thing over here does not affect my thing with you guys at all. Zero. But Sylvia Rohn was pissed off because I slighted her. I outsmarted her. If you're going to do uh, another In Vogue album and you're going to pull me out of the studio from recording, then I want my solo rights revoked. Mm -hmm. I want you to revoke my solo rights and I'm going to uh, go over here and record my solo album, but I'll be with In Vogue. I'll come to the studio every single day. I was on time every day in the studio with them. But she didn't like that I slighted her. So she's like, right. I'm going to fix you. So I'm going to kick you out of the group. You can't have any hidden agendas. I was like, Sylvia, you already know that I don't have any hidden agendas because you're the one who's doing my solo album. I don't understand what you're talking about. So, um, yeah. So she was like, you got to get out of the group. She, was, she wanted me out. And the other girls sat there and let it happen. So how did you feel after that? I mean, I can only imagine, you know, for some people that could have sent them spiraling into a deep depression. How did you handle that? I would say that I was depressed for a day. I promise you, I, I look at myself like, how did I make it through? How did, I think the first time that I saw their video without me, of course I cried that day as well. So I had my moments. Um, their first single was either whatever. I think it was whatever. And I can hear myself on the song. 
oh my gosh, wow. there's like this part that I do that goes through the whole song, and it's like it's part I, now. He, yes, exactly. Uh, uh, uh. It's too low for me right now, but it, it's a part that runs through the whole song, and you can hear me, and I'm like, oh my god, my mom said the same thing. She's like, Dawn, that is you. That is you. <laughs> so I was like, oh my God, I cried for that. I cried for other, but I was busy as well. Remember I was doing my solo album too. So I just made the, the most of it. I was in the studio with Dr. Dre. Uh, he really didn't know much about the R&B world. So his way of working with me didn't work for me. And so we, we broke up amicably as well. He let me go out of my deal. It was nothing. He was like, yeah, I can't really, cause he was working on um, Slim Shady album, which is Eminem, his first yeah. album. And that was a huge project for him. So he can really focus on me anyway. Um, How did you make yeah. your way to Dr. Dre? One more time. How did you make your way to Dr. Dre? Because that's huge for a producer. Isn't that huge? Yes, it is. Um, I don't even know. I want to say my manager reached out to Jimmy Iovine. And mm -hmm. Jimmy Iovine had Dr. Dre. And Dr. Dre was like, yeah, I want to work with you. So we had talked about it. Just before I started with the Envogue album, he talked to me about a solo album, but I wasn't ready yet. And I was I was still in the group. I mean, there was no, I wasn't even thinking about solo. So I was like, yeah, maybe one day we could do a song, but it would be great if you did a song for Envogue, like that. And so we had a conversation, but there was no solo. I wasn't even doing my solo album yet, Terry either. Mm -hmm. So later on, when I was solo, he was like, okay, let's talk about that now, that possibility now. Um, but, but and it, all of that happened after Lucy Pearl. Okay. So when I left in Vogue, I did, yeah, I went straight to um, Lucy Pearl situation because Raphael had reached out to my manager and she said, um, she said, yeah, I got a call from Raphael Sadiq, you know, um, from, you know, Ray Wiggins is his, is his real name. Uh, but mm -hmm. before he changed his name, Ray Wiggins, she said, and I said, Ray? She said, yeah, Raphael Sadiq. And I said, oh yeah, what's up? And she said, well, he wanted to know if he wanted to do this group idea. But I told mm. him no. You told him no. Wait, how? <laughs> let me let me clean my ears. Cause what did you no, did you say no. that you told him no before? So you guys had a conversation before you even told me that the idea was there or the or the the possibility of doing a group with him was there. You told him no before you actually told me that that the idea. So you didn't even run it past me yet. You told him no already. So I was like, let me find Raphael. I, I fired her because she had done a few things leading up to that that I did not like. Mm -hmm. And um, she treated me like I was a new artist. Like I didn't know how to make decisions for myself. Mm. So her and I parted, she and I, Cassandra Mills parted ways. I loved her. I thought she was a great manager. She just didn't mm -hmm. know how to, she Manager. was too overbearing. Yeah, way too overbearing with me. I didn't like that at all. Um, and then, um, yeah, so I called Raphael. I found him through, I don't know how I found him. But I was like, what is this idea you have? And of course I want to be down because I knew him. Like I said, we were 16 in the same band together. So I was just comfortable with him. He was like my brother. And I was like, yes, because I was too afraid to go solo first. Mm -hmm. Even though I was working on my solo album, I was still in, in, in vogue. You know what I mean? I was still in the group doing a right. solo album, but I was still with my girls. You know what I mean? It's still like being at home, but I just fly the coop a little bit, and, uh, leave the nest, as they say, and then come back. That's uh -huh. what I thought I had. Just mm -hmm. like Terry. Terry did a solo album and came back to the group. That's what I thought I had. So um, when he said, yeah, it's an idea that I have to do this super group idea, like you coming from En Vogue, me from Tony, 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 and then I have Ali from Sha um, Shahid from Trap Call Quest. So I was like, what? Yes. Did I say it too quick? Yes. Yes, I'm ready. Let's go. Let's record. Oh, my God. I just thought it was a brilliant idea. And, man, you're talking right. about an incredible body of work. That took us by storm. We were not expecting that group. Woo! Okay. We stepped on the scene. We embraced it. We danced not only tonight. We danced in the morning. We danced in the afternoon. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I know. Being in Lucy Pearl. I know. I know. Sonia, like seriously. Oh my God. I there's a couple of things that I regret, right? And I said, like I said, the invoke situation that I didn't tell Cindy and Terry I was doing a solo album, but Terry didn't tell us either. So I felt like to heck with you guys. Um 
<laughs> and, and again, as long as it's not affecting the En Vogue album, why should I tell you guys what's going on? I'm still in the studio every single day. You guys are none the wiser to anything. It's not affecting En Vogue, so why should I even tell you? But no, no, I, I get it. I get it a little bit. I can understand how if I'm in a group with you, even though we all have solo contracts, once you decide to embark, embark yes, upon Yes, of course, group, yeah. Like, yeah, let a sister know. Well, I won't have a problem. But, but, but remember I said Terry didn't tell us either. Yeah, but that's so Terry. I, no, 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 but the, hold on. But they didn't hold her accountable for it, so I'm not accountable for it. Like I said, I regret that. I totally regret not telling them, giving them a heads up, like you said. I, I regret that. Um, but I also felt like to hell with you guys because I was trying to get us to make a decision. And it was months. Terry's in the studio. She's recorded. She, now she's getting ready to go on tour and we're still not doing nothing. Mm. I'm getting ready to lose my house because you guys don't want to step to the plate and make a decision as the three of us. So no, I'm not going to tell you when I go in the studio. But I, it's not an excuse. I still should have told them. So, like I said, I regret that. So here we are, Lucy yeah. Pearl and Raphael. I did not. I did. I regret not reading the contract. What did it say? The contract. It was just not a good contract, and I didn't know that. So mm. I regret not reading the contract and making sure that the the T's and I's were dotted and crossed, or crossed and dotted. Yeah, and I didn't do that. And Raphael. It just wasn't a good contract. It was not good for me. It just didn't have the right, like he told but he told me contract for it to make it a right contract for you. What did you need in that contract? Oh, I don't remember it now. Please, you're talking about 2099, 2000. Um, it just didn't have it didn't cover me money wise. Okay. So, you know, I album sales and all this. I don't even know how much I got on that record. I know that it went um uh, gold at a certain point. I, I haven't seen money from Lucy Pearl very much. Like we get radio airplay, I get checks for that, but it would be like two hundred dollars or eleven fifty, eleven dollars and fifty cents. Like seriously, little checks. So it wasn't as big as in Vogue, and I understand not getting um, that kind of money, but I know they made money. Yeah, I know that so money was made. Sure, I know that money was made. So um, again, I was like, Dawn, you know, you keep making the same mistake. You hit your head against the wall, and you keep seeing it. How, you got to be smart. So now I don't care who it is I talk to. If they want a contract with me, first of all, I don't sign contracts with management because I never have. And Vogue never had a management contract. And anything that you guys want to do with me, if it's a contract, my attorney is looking it over. Yes. I don't have an I don't have an attorney on on hold or standby with me. But I find an attorney to look it over. Everything now. You it's know, important. It, it's, yes, it is. It's vital. It's vital. It's the difference between one more time. I said it's very important and vital. You know, I was once um, a few years ago working upon a, a, a new business deal, and um, the gentleman and I, we, you know, developed a great working relationship, a great professional relationship. It wasn't until I hired a lawyer to review mm -hmm. the contract that okay. our went totally downhill. He could not understand wow. why. I wanted to have a lawyer look over the contract. And thankfully I did because this potential business partner was about to beat me out of potentially, you know, millions. A lot of, of money. Oh, yeah. Sorry, that's a lot of money. Yes. It's important that, you know, you sign contracts. But I was going to ask, you know, you what you've learned from In Vogue, what did you take into Lucy Pearl? And I was hoping, you know, the contract <laughs> negotiation. <laughs> Sonia, oh my God, that sounded terrible because it made it sound like it's true. I didn't learn anything from the first one and I should have learned. But you should have known better. But once you get the lesson, to me, that's the most important. It's well, not you know, when you get it, it's that you do get the lesson. I but are you, angry? are you angry at um, Raphael? I'm angry at Raphael, but I'm angry at myself because... Mm. The saddest thing about it is that Raphael didn't have my back, but it's also that Dawn, you knew better. Yeah. You should have had your own back. Yeah. You don't wait for somebody to have your back. You've already gone through this mess with them. You know better. So yeah. I should yeah. have read my contract. That was up right. to me to make sure that, yeah, to do the business, the due diligence, as they say. And I did yeah. not. Yeah. So I can blame Raphael. I blame him because I also was, um, 
we were supposed to put our album out in June, July, August, September, October, November. Our album still wasn't out five months later. Wow. I kept telling Raphael, I, 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 you only gave me a small little advance and I put that on my house, but the money is running out and, and the album is still not out. So you are my record company. I need help. Like, come on, you gotta, you gotta make this work. What am I looking at? Here? Yeah, you gotta make this work. Blacks behind you. Talk about yes. that. I'm, yes. I'm getting. What, what are those blacks behind you? These are. This is. Um. This is. What am I pointing at? Nope, that's the wrong way. So this <laughs> is. This is. Um. Let me help show you. Yes. Come on. I'm so sorry. It's okay. So this one, can you see it? Is it too dark? No, we see it. Oh, wow. That's the, um, yep, the uh, uh, Funky Divas album. This is a, a cassette. <laughs> um, yeah. And it was for the Born to Sing, I'm sorry, Funky Divas album. So that's a platinum, that's a platinum, a gold plaque for that. And then this one up here, is Atlantic Records Hold On that was platinum certified nice. platinum sales for nice. Hold On. Yes. And then this wow. is just a this is just a poster of us. Uh-huh. So yeah, that's just a poster. And then I got the Lucy Pearl albums down here. Um and then there's another one. And this was at my parents' house. This is this wasn't a fire that they had. So it's all bubbled up like that. Yeah, but this is a platinum commemorates um, a platinum album as well for Funky Divas. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Right. And then oh, there's another gold for, for Hold On. And then this is um, Alicia Keys when we did this with her. Uh-huh. So that's Alicia and then me and Terry, I don't know if you can see all this, just, is it crazy? <laughs> and Maxine, and then Cindy, and we were on stage. That was the- um, Nice. Yeah, the award show for uh, BET Awards in 2008. Yeah. Nice, nice. Thank you so, so much. Back to Lucy Pearl. Yes. So what happened, well, we know the money was right. The money was definitely funny, but the music was amazing. But I guess that wasn't, enough to sustain the but, group. So what even happened where the group broke up? I was okay with it not being a lot of money. My problem was I had Raphael's back. Mm -hmm. I had his back. He said that he would have mine. He said, I don't have a lot of money to give you up front, um, but I will find whatever you need whenever you need it. Right. Um, if it. So here I am. I'm like, Raphael, I need money. It's been five months now. The record's not out yet and I need help. And he was like, well, I don't know what to tell you. Every man for himself, you know? I, I don't know what to, I was like, what? Wow. You told me that you'd have my back. And what you tell me? Every man for himself? First of all, I'm a woman, okay? <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> and you told me every man for himself. Like, I just had a problem with that. Like, really? Like, so he had me, he said, we'll call, um, we were supposed to do the Love and Basketball soundtrack for um, Dance Tonight. And he said, call Pilar and let her know that you're gonna do it by yourself. I was like, dude, if I call her to tell her that I'm doing that alone, it's gonna, that's bad business. Right. She's gonna be confused because we signed as Lucy Pearl to do on to do that project. Here mm -hmm. I am calling her to say, uh, guess what, Pilar? I'm gonna do it by myself. He's like, well, I don't know what to tell you, so call her. Wow. So I called her. Five minutes into the conversation, she's like, I said, well, Pilar, I'm calling to let you know that I'm going to do the Lucy Pearl, uh, uh, do the soundtrack by myself. And I could hear the comment, the confusion and, and like, huh, what are you talking about? And she said, um, you guys were supposed to do that together. I said, I know, but I, I need the money right now because my, and she's like, oh my God, like, this is really bad. And I said, you know what? It's okay, Pilar. It's all right. Don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. um, and I ended up losing my house during the Lucy Pearl project. The first time we went overseas, I was packing my house and putting everything in boxes. And I was also packing up my um, my suitcase to go overseas. So you could imagine how that felt. 
I was bitter. I was angry. I barely talked. I, I was losing sleep. I mean, I don't get very emotional to where it tears me down or annihilates my spirit, but that's how I felt. I felt like, okay, you know, you're supposed to be my brother. I believed in you. I had your back. I turned on a deal that was on the table for me with RCA. Like RCA had a, a solo deal for me, Bob Jameson. Yeah. And I called him when the, the Lucy Pro project came up and I said, Bob, I think this is a brilliant idea. Raphael has a super group idea for us. And it's just, it's a way for us to get back out there individually and together as a group. Cause mm -hmm. people haven't seen us in years. And I think this is so brilliant. And he said, no, I don't agree. And I said, well, thank you, sir. I appreciate your time. Peace out. And I turned that deal down for Raphael. So now you're telling me every man for himself, like, whoa, whoa, this is different. This is wow. And so through the whole project, I was forgiving, even forgiving him, even though he did that to me. Wow. Even though he did that, I was still forgiving. And I, our last time in Amsterdam, we were overseas all together. So we did London, Paris, Germany. And we were in Amsterdam for our, our last show and we were celebrating, we had a bottle of champagne that this whole Lucy Pro project, which was, it was a one-off from the beginning. It was only supposed to be one album. So it was never gonna be multiple albums. Yeah, from the beginning. Yeah, exactly. So one album, one year, one deal, that's it. Um, if we like it, we'll come back together and do another one. But at that point I was like, F you, I lost my house. <laughs> you didn't have my back. You are nothing what you said you were, and you're jealous. He kept showing all this jealousy every time we go overseas or anywhere, I'm sorry, anytime we do interviews. Um, we did Sprite Night here in, in uh, Vegas for the American Music Awards, I think it is, or Billboard Awards. And you're supposed to go from table to table to table. All It's like thousands of tables with radio stations sitting at each table. So you may talk to Sweden over here or Africa over there or New York over here or Wisconsin yeah. over there. You know what I mean? And we were standing against the wall and we were waiting. It was loud, super loud in there. And Lee Bailey has been doing syndicated radio for years, decades, right? This old, older man. And he comes walking over and he's smiling. <laughs> he's not looking at us. He's looking at the floor and he starts smiling and he gets closer to us and Raphael was standing to my left, Ali was to my right. And um, Lee Bailey walks over and he takes out of his pocket because he had one of those old school jackets on with a pocket in it. And he takes out um, on the jacket had a pocket and he takes out a dictaphone, like a little recorder. And he steps in between me and Raphael and he says, um, wow, we got, a, we got Lucy Pearl here. And Raphael said, excuse me, don't you see I'm standing here? Fuck. Wow. And he walked away, Sonia. And I was like, I looked at Ali and I said, we are done. We're done. Because I knew it was like, you know, you just don't do that in this business. You don't do that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? That could really be detrimental for us. The way yeah. he treated Lee Bailey. Yeah. Um, the way you treat anybody, it just gets back. Oh, they're nasty. They're not nice. They're mean to, you know what I mean? It just gets back. Our reputation um, precedes us. And um Lee Bailey didn't take anything of it. He just said, Oh, Raphael, um, everybody wants to stand next to Dawn. You know, he kind of blew it off because he could have really made a mess of it. He really right. could have been, you know what I mean? And went there with Raphael. <clears throat> and he didn't do that. And I was like, wow. And we went on and did the interview. And he talked to Ali and he talked to me and he talked to Ali. He talked to both of us. So Raphael could have had a really good interview. Right. Had he not get jealous. So I started to see those little things and I was like, whoa, when we got to London, you know, when you get overseas, they do as many interviews with you as they can because they know that they're not, they're not going to see you for a while. It's, it's a long way for you to come for, for them to do interviews. Right. So today it's different because you can do Zoom and all kinds of stuff, you know. Um, but back then they didn't have that. So they're like, oh my, from 8 a.m. I was in hair and makeup at six to prepare for eight. And we had breakfast and then we were, Interview, 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 interview all day long. Interview, interview. You try to get lunch and you're like, interview, 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 <laughs> you know. Um, and so one of the the, the hosts uh, was doing an interview with us, one of the interviewers. And she was so, so Dawn and on Vogue and on Vogue this and on Vogue and blah. Raphael stopped her and he said, excuse me. 
But don't you see Ali and I are sitting here? Now, I was in the middle of them again. It was always, that's the way they wanted us to be. Because I'm the girl. I sit in the middle most times. So Raphael to my left again. Ali to my right. And they're both sitting back on the couch. They're leaning back. I'm sitting up doing my interview. But they're both leaning back. And she said, um, Raphael says, damn, excuse me. Um, don't you realize that Raf Ali and I are here too? And he looked around me to see Ali. And he was like, we've, we've done a lot in our careers as well. Like, don't you want to talk to us? And she said, yes. But Dawn has done a lot more. Ah, it's true. Dawn on Vogue has done. They're much bigger than you. <laughs> I, what? I was like, oh my god! Did she just say what? that? Ooh, she just said that. She just schooled you. <laughs> but that was the reason Rafia wanted me in the group in the first place. He said you were pop. You were crossover. I didn't cross over with the Tonys. Right. Ali didn't cross over with the Tonys, but he has the hip hop element that he brings. I bring the the um the R and B and you bring the R and B and, and crossover pop appeal. Yeah. So that's why I want you in the group. Yeah. So why is he jealous? Why are you jealous of me? So when he got joy, um I we had just gotten back from Amsterdam. We all agreed that we were not gonna do Lucy Pearl again, right? We're not gonna do Lucy Pearl again, right? All of us agreed. The three of us agreed we're not gonna do it. Raphael. I got. I kept getting um, texts from people saying um, it was when you could type your text and you could text and read the text. And I was like, oh, my God, what? Rolling Stone magazine was asking me for an interview. And I was like, huh? It's not like we're doing anything else. Um, they said, we heard about Lucy Pearl. I hope you're OK. We'd love to do an interview with you. What? So when I got home, because we didn't have cell phones as readily as we do today. It was like back then it was the big brick phones and I didn't yeah. have one. So I got home and I called and she said, yeah, my name is Rosie and I'm calling from Rolling Stone magazine and I just, Ruby, I'm sorry, Rosie, Ruby. And I wanted to know how you feel. And I was like, what do you mean, Lucy Pearl? What you, we, we're done. And she said, well, apparently not because they have a new girl named uh, Joy. What? Yeah, they have a new, you know, and I'm glad she couldn't see me because that was my reaction too. And I'm like, my whole stomach fell, like I had butterflies. They have a new girl named Joy, and um, you know, I talked with her yesterday. Huh? Wait a minute, you, they're already a thing? And she said, yeah, they're not recording, but they're on the road, they're touring. Yeah, and I was like, what are you saying? And she said, yeah, um, but I talked with with uh, Joy yesterday, and Joy was not very um, generous towards you. She wasn't very kind towards you. And I was like, well, what do you mean? She said, well, I asked her what it's like to fill such huge shoes. I mean, you're coming into Lucy Pro, and no one really knows who you are yet. And Lucy Pro made a huge impact on the world. So those are big shoes to fill to come in and stand in for Dawn. And she said, well, I'm not a stand in. I'm Dawn's funky replacement. And she said, whoa, you got a little um, tinge of, uh, I don't know how she put it, anger or how she said, she, you sound a little angry towards Dawn. She said, well, um, Ali and Raphael told me that she's a bitch, you know, so I got to believe them because they know her better than I do. That kind of stuff. And I was like, wow. And she said, so how do you feel about that? And I said, well, Ruby, um, this is how much that impacted me that I remember the, in, the, um, the journalist name that did the interview from Rolling right. Stone. I said, well, it's really too bad that she feels that way towards me, but I wish her the best. I wish Lucy Pearl the best. Um, I'm kind of thrown off because it's like you're, it, I'm blindsided today. Right now I'm blindsided. Um, we agreed that we were not going to go on and do anything else. So I'm shocked. Um, but again, I wish them the best. And um, wow, I, I was just lost. Yeah. So That's again, nice. that happened twice. And I'm, it felt even yeah. worse for Lucy Pearl because I helped build in Vogue. But that was our pr producers putting us together, having an audition, blah, blah, blah. Lucy Pearl was us creating the name, the sound, the music, like I said, the sound and the likeness, what we're going to wear, how we're going to look this time, the rock and roll element that we had. That was us. And you guys have another girl. A mm. month later, maybe, maybe two months later, they were on um, BET. It was hard for me to watch anything, so everybody would be calling me, hey, pick up the phone, you got to turn it on. It's They're on the American Music Awards, or they're on this. And I was like, guys, I don't want to see this. So my ex-boyfriend recorded it. And maybe about three days after it was recorded, I looked at it. I had the guts. I sat there and I cried through it, but I looked. 
excuse me, and Raphael was on, they were on, um, I should say all of them were on, uh, so it was Ali, Raphael, and Joy. And they were on, what was it called? Um, TRL, sorry, 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 no. 106 okay. and Park on BET. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. Raphael said, yeah, so we got a, we got a real star here now. We got a, we, we replaced Dawn. We got a real star now. Oh, Everybody wow. was like, dude, are you kidding me? We don't even know who she is. What are you talking <laughs> about? A real star. Like, come on, dude. And he did it again the next day. I didn't watch him on BT, but apparently um, he did it again on BT the next day on, on uh, TRL MTV the wow. next day. So that kind of stuff. I was like, so you were jealous enough. I was, I was stealing your shine from you. Right. You know, and you couldn't stand that. So you're going to get somebody who's a lesser, not as a human being. She's a beautiful human being. I'm sure. I don't know her, but as an artist, you cannot compare having someone from En Vogue who the world hmm. knows to having someone that nobody knows, or she's kind of known throughout the Atlanta area, but that's it. Right, right. You know, so I think she had done some campaigns and modeled a little bit uh, for um, the Gap. I think she did a couple of Gap commercials. But, the, you know, as a singer, nobody knew who Joy was. So that was really right. rude. It was mean spirited. And I could tell right then, I was like, that is why it's like you put things together in your head. And I was like, that's why he didn't want me in the group, because I was showing him up. Yeah. And I remember yeah. I, I brought it. I brought an article. For the girls to read an article about taking back our power, um, Salt and Pepper mm -hmm. had done it. I brought it to rehearsal. It was, um, I want to say, like uh, Spin Magazine, maybe, or Roll, um, Rolling Stone Magazine. But I brought it for the girls to read, taking our power back. No, it was um, it was XXL, the, the Source Magazine. Um, and I brought that for them because they were taking their power back, and we had done What a Man. And I was like, girl, mm -hmm. you know, you guys got to read this article. And I brought it to rehearsal and they left it on the piano. When we left, nobody picked it up to read it. Nobody wanted to see the power that we could possibly possess if we stand up for ourselves. Nobody right. wanted that. And then uh, I brought another I brought another article. I'm sorry. That's a difficult thing, you know, to step into your power. It comes with a lot. Like I'm a woman who wholeheartedly believes that we should step into our power. But there are people who know that there will be turmoil waiting on the other side of the door. Exactly, the exactly. But I know but, the industry is but this, with different this turmoil, But this was what I was telling them. Yes, there's turmoil on the other side of the door. Salt Pepper had the same thing. Never scared to walk away from Herbie Lovebug, who was their producer. But he kept telling them, you guys can't write like me. I'm the one who writes your hits. Y'all can't walk away from me, blah, blah, blah. They walked away from him and they wrote their biggest hit. Express yourself. You have to take chances. We have yeah. each other. It's not like we're solo artists walking away and we're only, we only have ourselves, we're by ourselves. We have each yeah. other. So yes, it's scary, it's difficult, but we have the power. What did you do to reclaim your power after those two horrific events where to me, it seemed like your loyalty was betrayed? How did you step into your power or redeem your power? I'm always forgiving. This is what I see in myself. I know that I forgive. I know, you know, we know who we are as people. You lay your head on your pillow at night and you think, wow, I did that. Or I said that, or that wasn't right. I shouldn't have did that to them. Or wow, they did that to me. That was not okay. We, we, we value, we evaluate our lives. You know what I mean? <clears throat> I have always been this way. I've always been forgiving um, to a fault, to a mm -hmm. fault. I've been forgiving to the fault, to the point where I've had people in my life, like my ex-husband, cheating on me, cheating on me, cheating on me, having babies outside of our marriage oh, with wow. other women while we were married. Like, don't wow. run. Come on. Yeah. And I and I felt like, because he did that with a lot of women from, um, at the time, it was MySpace. And they were fans of mine. Ooh. So they didn't know he was my husband. And then he would right. tell them, oh, yeah, my wife is this. But, you know, we're estranged from each other right now. No, we're not. <laughs> you chose to leave, but I'm still here at home. And so when he would come back, he'd be like, yeah, you know, I, I, it was like a feather in his cap almost to have this woman after him and that woman and this woman. It's like, and they would be like, oh my God, I didn't know your husband was Dre Allen. I had, did I say his name? Yeah. I didn't know your husband was Dre Allen. And um, he told me after, and I didn't realize that. And I'm so sorry. And I'm like, oh my God, Dre, you were killing me with this shit. But my mm -hmm. pride wouldn't let me walk away from the marriage. I was determined to say, okay. And I've heard 
Snoop Dogg's wife at one point, she's like, yeah, he was with a few women, but they may have had him for a night, but I have him for a lifetime. And I'm like, oh now God. in hindsight, when I hear that, I'm just like, oh my God, I don't want you for a lifetime if you were with anybody other than me. Are you kidding? Now I know better. But at the yeah. time I was just like, my pride wouldn't allow me to walk away from him. I was mm. a different person than who I am now. So I look at that like, I hear women talk about being a victim a lot. And I watched my mom be a victim to men when we were younger. And I was like, I, I, I'm never going to be with a man who hits me until I was with a man who hit me. Now, I felt like different because it was my husband as opposed to a boyfriend. I could just walk away. It's a marriage. I'm going to see it through. Remember in the movie, What's Love Got to Do With It? Tina Turner. Yeah. yeah at the house. She was there. They were having some kind of barbecue or party. And yeah. the background dancers and her mother was standing there in the house and she was like, Mom, she said, Look, look at look at um look at Ike over there with that girl. And her mother said, Child, what's wrong? And she said, Mom, but I mean he's right in front of me doing this. And she said, Girl, or child or honey or whatever, she said, keep your mouth shut. This man gives you a nice home. Look at this beautiful mansion you're living in. You got something to say. Don't don't tell him about it. In other mm. words, suck it up. We've always been told to suck it up. And I watched my grandmother suck it up. I watched my mother suck it up. And I was determined at that time, at that point in my marriage, I'm not going to suck it up anymore. So, so I was proud of myself for walking away. Right. So wait a minute. Oh, so, so while you were in, in, a member of, of Invoke, you were married and going through an abusive relationship as well? I wasn't married to Dre until after I got out of Invoke. So I met Dre in between... I want to say I met Dre in 2003. So I was way gone. I was way out of Lucy Pearl and in Vogue. So what so, was it? With, physical, mental, emotional? What type of abuse were was, you in? It was physical. It was mental and emotional. Mm. Yeah, he's very extremely. I didn't even know the term narcissistic until I met him. I didn't. I heard the word, but I didn't know what it meant until I met him. And my attorney was like, she was a female. And she said, Dawn, my parents were narcissistic, both of them were narcissistic. They were very rich. They had a lot of money, but they did not feed the kids. And they would mentally break us down and physically break us down because they wouldn't feed us. So the people that would take care of the horses on the property would sneak us food because our parents wouldn't feed yeah. us. And they would let us get on the brink of almost dying and being so weak that they would give us food. And then for months, they wouldn't give us anything else. And we were so skinny and thin that um, the people that would take care of the horses were like, oh my God, these kids are going to die. So my phone is going to die. Actually, I just tapped it. Um, but yeah, so he was he was mentally abusive and physically abusive. And I'm proud of getting out of that, too. It took me seven years. But I would say t if we were together seven years. But I would say total actually living together, probably three, because he was always on the road with some other woman. Always. Out and I was like, my pride. I'm Dawn Robinson. You're not going to cheat on me. And when you come home, you're going to be my husband. You know what I mean? And right. Right. Stupid, stupid stuff that I would tell myself. Stuff that, um, to this day, I'm just like, Dawn, you really thought that way? I became someone that I did not recognize. Mm -hmm. Someone that I would never, ever do again. I won't let that ever happen to me again, but it happened. You know what I mean? So now I know better. Now I'm much stronger. Um, yeah, so yeah, I, I didn't know who I was. But even in the group, I was much stronger even then. I was stronger yeah. in my groups and I walked away. I walked away from in Vogue at the height of born of a did. don't let go of being the biggest hit. I could have stayed with them. They, they gave me an ultimatum and their ultimatum was our way or the highway. And I took the highway. I could have stayed and been with them and, and did it their way. But I was like, no, I'm determined. I'm going to do this on my own. So I was much stronger in the group situation than I was with my ex-husband. Wow. Yeah. So all that happened to you in your personal life regarding relationships and in your professional life uh, as it relates to being an artist and a musician. And right. how do you now look at the industry now? Like, do you look at it like, okay, this is a safe place for me? Or do you look at it like, okay, I need to be cautious, cautious of every step that I make and every conversation that I have? Cautious, very cautious. If I'm not, if I didn't learn anything, then I'd be a fool. I yeah. messed up with Lucy Pearl because again, I learned and I knew better, but I didn't do better. I didn't read that contract. I knew better, but I didn't do it. So now, like I said, when I see a contract is whoop, 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 I'm going, <laughs> I'm going through it like a fine tooth comb with a fine tooth comb because I'm not going to let it happen again. Yeah. Um, so and I look at the industry. The industry is what it is. The industry is is supposed to 
look out for itself. But I'm supposed to do the same thing. And that's what I was telling Cindy, Maxine, and Terry, and Cindy, and Max, and Terry. Um, we're supposed to look out for ourselves. Raphael, to this day, I'm like, you know, we had something so beautiful. And yeah. you allowed it to be messed up and destroyed because you had an ego. Mm -hmm. And you wouldn't get out of your own way. And we were on your label. We were signed to Pookie Records to the bigger label through your label. Just like I was signed to, um, and Vogue was signed to Atlantic Records through Too Tough Enough Productions. We had a production deal. I was signed to your label. I was your artist and you didn't look out for me. It makes no sense. So you lost out big time. I love you, but I cannot look back at Lucy Pearl either because until Raphael apologizes to me, if Raphael comes to me and says, Dawn, I am sorry. I was, you know, I didn't look out for you at all. You had my back. You turned on RCA for me. You know what I mean? You you really did believe in me. And I told you that I was gonna have your back if you needed me too. And I didn't do that. And I'm sorry. Okay, I love you. Let's work. That's what I would do. Let's work. Yeah. Let's get to work. Thank you for apologizing. Now this contract that you give me this time, I'm gonna d d double, triple check it. You feel me? It's gonna be a totally different look, but I, yeah. I would do it again because I love Raphael that much. I love Lucy Pearl that much. I love yeah. what we did together. I love I you both it, too. I hope it gets to that place. Um, I'm just so sad that it's taken this amount of time and he hasn't circled back to have a conversation. He did Nor circle I'm back. Not. He circled back. He did but circle no, back. I'm so last year I was watching Beach Rhymes and Rhythms on MTV and it was about Tribe Called Quest. So over the years, What's his name? Fife would always big me up in the song, um, in, in his song on Tribe Called Quest and on a song for uh, the beginning of Crazy Sexy Cool album for TLC, he bigged me up again. My man, I'll be sure he's in effect mode. Used to have a crush on Dawn from In Vogue. It's not like nothing people want to give with me, but just in case I got my condoms in TLC, right? He did that twice, Sonia, twice. And I was sitting there watching Beach Rhymes and Rhythms, and I was like, oh, my God. So I muted the TV, and I called Ali right away, and I said, Ali, I have a great idea. I know um, Fife is gone. He died in, um, oh, I want to say in 2005 or six or something like that. I said, but I have this idea. Um, I want to do a song called the, – the, this happened last year. I want to do a song called um, – uh, what do you call it? crush and i want to do that with the 16 bars that i get from from um fife uh -huh. my man i'll be sure he's in effect more i want to get those 16 bars with fife and i want to do a song called crush and dedicate it to him um and i told fife that before he died we were in contact with each other talking on instagram i'm sorry the instagram didn't even exist this was twitter before instagram happened um and he was trying to get me tracks but he was always too sick and we never really got to work and then he ended up dying so I was like, I have to do the song. He said, that's a brilliant idea. I love it. I love it. I love it. Let me talk to his wife because right now she's putting together an album for him of stuff that he never released. And that mm -hmm. would be a great song for his album. In the meantime, Raphael wants you to call him. I'm like, Raphael, Ali, every time you tell me that, I give you my number. I tell you, have him call me. Raphael never calls me. So he said, okay, I'll give him your number. We hung up. And I was like, immediately, I said, no, no. There's a lot of stuff that transpired between, because he wanted me to do a song with him, a show with him in New York. And I said, no, Raphael has to talk to me about what transpired while we were together. I lost my house, mm. not my purse. I didn't lose a purse or a pen, a favorite pen that I had and I left it in his car or I lost my house. Mm. And you're not apologizing to me for that. And then mm. you kicked me out of the group. Mm -hmm. or, he didn't kick me out because the group was over. But you went on to do stuff, even though we agreed that we weren't going to do a group after that. Right. And you too, Ali, by the way, you too. Because we all agreed, all three of us agreed that one year is up, we're done, we're not doing anymore. And you guys went on without me. So mm -hmm. I can hold you accountable too. But Raphael, definitely. Because <clears throat> he was my record company. And every time I said I needed money, he never, yeah, like I said, so I lost my house. Um, so you spoke, but what did you so speak Ali, about? Well, Ali sent him that text that I sent to him because I sent it in a text. I said, tell Raphael that we have to talk before anything, any further business happens between us, we got to have a conversation. And mm -hmm. Ali said, um, he texted me back. He said, okay, I'll send this to him. So he copy pasted, sent it to Raphael. Raphael called me that night. I was charging my phone and I was walking my dog. When I came in the house, he had called me 
And he said, yeah, he left a message saying, yeah. So Ali sent me the message and I read it. And um, yeah, so what's this about you being upset because you lost your house? Nobody gives a fuck about that. Nobody cares that you lost your house. So yeah, and I hung up. I deleted the message because I couldn't even, I couldn't listen to it. He was being mean spirited. You don't give a fuck that I lost my house. That tells me who you're, that tells me what your heart is. Yeah. That tells me who you are as a person. You're yeah. not going to change from that person. So I think about maybe four or five months. This is last year, like I said. So maybe about four or five months later, 2019. About four or five months later, he calls me and he says, yeah, Don. Um, you know, I was really young when we were in Lucy Pearl and I wasn't thinking correctly. No. Nigga, this just happened <laughs> last year, a few months ago. You just told me that nobody gave a fuck that I lost my house. You just said that. Right. Yeah, so I'm supposed to act like I forgot, all oh, that didn't happen. You just told me that nobody gave a fuck that I lost my house. Wow. And what was his response? One more time. What was his response once you said that? Oh no, he had left a message for me. I missed his call. Oh, and when I came in the house, yeah, from walking my dog, he left me a message. A message like that? Oh my god. Like that. Like wow. that. And I deleted wow. it. Yeah. Because it was mean. I didn't want to hear anything else. Like if you can't have compassion for someone you supposedly care about, someone who had your back, like I said, I turned that deal down with RCA. We agreed we weren't gonna do Lucy Pearl anymore and you went on without me and I'm still willing to, to forgive you. Right. That hurt, come on, yeah. I helped you make Lucy Pearl. Lucy Pearl wouldn't have been what it was without any one of us not there. That's the true. three of us made that group what it was. Come on, so, so give me the credit. He, he does apologize. And he says, listen, you if know, he apologizes wow. now and it's from his heart, it's kind of too late because when someone tells you who they are, you believe them the first time. I was going to tell right? you, Dawn, I said, let's talk about those lessons we learned. You know, I That's understand right. people, but the way that they move, their actions, their vibes, their energy, it speaks more volumes than anything that comes out of their mouth. Absolutely. You can and say a whole lot of stuff, but what you, what you show me as a human being is what I see. Your exactly. actions, exactly. You can say a bunch, right? But I'm seeing what you, you you just told me that you didn't give a fuck about it. Now you're telling me, well, I was young back then. Yeah, you were young in 2000. We were both young in 99, 2000. Right. But you just said nobody gives a fuck. You forgot that Last you just year. left me a message a couple months ago. And That's if I had right. it to play it back for him, I would have played it back for him if I had it. I would have called him and played it back. But I listened to his message and I was like, oh no, this is still that evil. Mean spirited. Yeah. Nobody gives a fuck that you lost your house. Anytime a black person loses their home, it's hard for us to buy it in the first place. And we lose yeah. our home, our equity. My credit is still affected to this day because I lost my house. So, and wow. you don't care. No, you don't give a fuck. Oh, okay. All right. So, so yeah, you, going not, to, not to measure your, your, your pocket or for, you know, your bank account, but how are you making money? Are you still making music? No. No, I'm not making music right now. Nobody's really doing shows because that's how we would mostly make our money. Um, so nobody's hiring us to do shows. COVID has shut everything down for the year. Yeah. But I'm very good with saving my money. So from the shows I did last year with Maxine, by myself, I did three three shows, Philly Pride, El Paso Pride, and Orlando Pride. And then Maxine and I did three shows together, one of which I only got $500 for because she had already gotten paid before she brought me in. She was kind yeah. enough to... Um, asked me to do the shows with her. And one of the shows gave us $500. The other one gave me a thousand. And the other one, I forgot how much. I think we got paid our top dollar, which is 4,000 a piece. Um, but I'm good with stretching my money, like I said. So this whole year I've been living off my savings. Um, right now I'm living with my parents. You know, it's, it is what it is. Everybody's kind of consolidating households because they kind of have to. Um, yeah. It's not fun <laughs> because I love my parents. Don't get me wrong, but Dawn, I'm are you to meet the dogs? My Dawn. from New York. She's from East Coast too, so she's really got her accent. So Dawn, you gotta feed the dogs. Dawn, come see what's on TV. Dawn, mom, mom, I just sat down to write but, my book. <laughs> oh my God, I'm, I'm gonna share something with you. Oh my I, God. I've consulted. I'm here with my parents as well. Well, my mom's Are you? Oh my gosh. But my dad's here. My brother's here. 
And before yeah. every single interview, I have to say, don't forget, don't call me. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Sonia. So, Sonia, you want to eat? Are you hungry? Yes. Oh, my God. Mom, no. The other day my, wait, I was doing an interview the other day, and my stepdad opened the door, and I was like, <laughs> yes. so I can I definitely not. to you. My heart goes I back to it. I could not. Thank you. Yours too. I'm grateful, actually. I, I'm enjoying being here this time because when they first moved to Vegas in 2015, I moved out here um, to help them acclimate. And I left my apartment and came here. And I was like, well, why get an apartment so quickly? You guys have three bedrooms. I can give you the money for uh, rent instead of paying for an apartment on my own. So I stayed here with them. And my mom and I had it out really bad at that point. She just got really evil. Something <laughs> it's, it's a different mom than I had ever seen before. So I started looking up the early stages of dementia. Like seriously, my grandpa had it and I thought maybe it was her uh, that she had it too. Mm -hmm. And, um, we really had a bad falling out. So it wasn't a good time at that time, but this time is different. And I think exactly. because I was hustling back then too and trying to get things to work, but now she sees things actually coming together for me. And I'm like investors and um, it, it's just different this time than it was before. And, and she's happy for me. She was happy then too, but I don't know. It was just something came out of her. It was like a, she was demonic. I was, I mean that. Um, and sometimes people get very evil and sometimes they are demonic. So I was like, mom, what is up with you? Like that, it just wasn't her. It wasn't the mother right. that I know. Yeah. Right, so right. yeah, I'm, I'm enjoying being with them now, but I am ready to go. I'm ready to go. It's been, only, <laughs> it's been three months. It's been three months, but I am like ready. ready. So, wait, so, so if the studios open back up again, you know, will you yes. go back into the studio? We yes. want to hear you. From you, Dawn. Exactly, Sonia. I'm sorry you did ask me that. Um, so thank yeah. you so much. Thank you so much. Mwah, mwah, mwah. Um, so I have, like I said, I have different people working with me now, and I'm working on my autobiographical book. I have a great um, what is the guy? Uh, my publisher, book publisher is amazing, and I love him. He's like my consultant for the music business as well because he's been in the music industry. He worked for major labels back in the day, so he knows contracts and he helps me with those things. Um, but he also is doing my book with me. So I'm writing that. In the meantime, he's like, your book can help catapult your record. You can have mm. the money from your book to do your record. You can have the money from your record to do your clothing line and a mm. perfume or a fragrance line or a makeup line. I want to do a makeup line or a lipstick line. So, um, but I also have other people that want to give me the money right now. So I can get a place of my own and work on the record at the same time work on the book and fit because I cannot with my parents. I can't. They have their TVs are so loud that when I try to concentrate on my book, I'm hearing the TV and I'm like, oh my God, Obama did what? Obama said what? Um <laughs> Trump did what? What did Trump right. do again? And I'm like, oh my God. And I gotta go out and listen and watch the TV with them. I'm just like, I can't concentrate on working and really getting things done the way I should. So I need a place of my own right now. And they're willing to help me with that. You know, it's like amazing. I'm, I'm not asking anybody. I love that part. I so have asked you anyone have, help. Have so you getting, thought about um, OnlyFans? I, I, say it again, OnlyFans? OnlyFans, yeah, you can sing a few things and you know, people can pay to watch your OnlyFans, right. create content with, you know, maybe wow. you you singing something. Exactly. People are paying. Somebody, somebody told me about OnlyFans, but I thought it was, I don't know what I thought it was. Maybe I misunderstood, but I was going to do a Kickstarter. And you, only you, you have, yeah, Kickstarter or Indiegogo, some kind of uh, crowdfunding. And uh, it's hard to ask fans for anything. Yeah, but that's why I did the, the um, Indigo, whatever that is, the GoFundMe. Indiegogo aren't doing that anymore because they want to actually get something for their money. Well, you, so I think you are getting something at the end of the campaign. You do get a record out. You do get your album done and they get a free but, book or a free, in my case, they get a free phone call with me and they have dinner with me. And No. People no. Get a little bored. TLC tried to do that and we didn't get a damn thing. So that I don't was on think them, that though. No, 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 no. Hold on now. Hold on. Let me tell you why this is, oh, I, why I don't agree. Um, so Whoopi Goldberg did one. She did well with her project. 
Jim James Franco, the actor James Franco, the white guy. Yeah. He did his campaign. Yeah. He did his project as well. That came out. Uh, Kristen Bell asked for two point five million dollars. She got five point four million dollars. She got the biggest campaign of all. Hmm. Huge, huge. Yeah, De La Soul did one as well. They asked for three hundred. Uh, I'm sorry, one hundred fourteen or fifteen thousand, and they got um, six hundred thousand. Yeah. So it does work, and they came out with their project too. So I don't know what happened with TLC and why they didn't come out with their album, but like you said, they didn't do a damn thing. I don't know what happened with the girls, but um, I hear you. Um, so my my. It's called uh, fans only. The only fans, only fans. Only fans, only fans. Okay, only fans. All right. Yeah, I'm gonna, we'll I'll consider that. I'm gonna look into it. Now you're you're breaking up the sound. I know. I, I see it too. But I know yeah. we've been we've been chatting for a while now. Um, yeah. So I want to wrap up this conversation. Where can my listeners and my viewers find you on social media? Oh, you sound funny. <laughs> can, do I sound funny? No, you don't. Oh, I, okay, good. Um, I, I, I hope they can hear you because I can hear you, but it's it, if you talk slow, then I can hear you. Where can Watch I find fans find me? Right mm -hmm. um, on social media. Right now, I'm just on. I have DawnRobinson.com, and I'm doing a website. That's what I mean. All these people are helping me with all these things. It, it's like God rained down all these beautiful, beautiful, beautiful human beings to help me this time. And I've been offered help before, so Sonia. But it wasn't. It wasn't the same. It was like they hand they they put their hand out to help me, but they had a dagger at the same time, and they were stabbing me. It's like that, you know. So in this case, I just feel like these are blessings. These are real angels that are helping me with my projects. So I have two people that offered websites. Um, I'm gonna do a website soon. That'll be done very soon, and then they're working up the mocking up the mock up for it right now. Um, so that should be out in the next couple of months. And then um, uh, I'm also working on my autobiographical book called um, Break a Dawn. And I just started my, my uh, Stiletto Entertainment is the name of my, my record company, my record label. So the money, I, the other, one of the other guys is like, okay, what do you need right now? What is it that you need? And I said, but... I don't know you to tell you what I need. Like, you know, I need a million dollars. Like, come on. He's like, okay, so when when do you need that? Mm. Okay, I was just playing. I was making a joke. You're serious? And he said, yeah. I mean, he said, I can help you get, um, I can help you get an investor. So excuse the phone. I'm glad it happened at the end of the conversation. <laughs> exactly, I told you. Now, now the answer she is going to pick up. Oh Lord, Emily, Barbara Jane, this is Dana. Oh my God, this, yeah, calling my mom. Oh, it didn't pick up. Okay, they turned it off for me. They were kind enough to do that before they left the house because they knew I was doing an interview for a change. Um, yeah, but it, it, a couple of times I was on an interview and they were like, uh, somebody called from the hospital. Uh, Mr. Alexander, can you call me back? This is so and so hospital calling for. Ah, I'm doing an interview, you guys. Shh. I know. I know. <laughs> terrible. Terrible. So that's what I'm doing, Sonia. I'm working on my book, and I will soon to be working on new music. I am yeah. so excited about that. Oh, my God. I really, I'm happy to do a book, but music is where it's at for me. I sang the other day on somebody's interview, and I hadn't sung in a long time, so I was nervous about that. It was, it was called Five Songs um, That Changed Your Life. You sound mm -hmm. better, by the way. You're back to yeah. normal. Yeah. <laughs> you don't sound like an alien. Um, and so I did a show called Five Songs That Changed Your Life. And the guy, Jason, I think his name is, and I was singing and I was nervous because I was singing Minnie Ripperton. And uh -huh. um, I had to do that high note. And I haven't done that, I swear to you, I would say probably 11, 12 years. Hadn't sung that song. Loving you, and I mean, I sounded so great. I was really proud of myself. I needed that boost because my, my, you get insecure about if you're capable. And I've heard other people who have been away for a while, they say the same thing. They kind of like, do I still have what it takes? You know what I mean? You get that kind of feeling inside. So, 10% really? <laughs> battery though. I'm getting the battery, the battery is dying, but yeah. Um, I really, I really felt good about that. So I'm, I'm excited to get back in the studio.
that's gonna happen. Good. I, don't worry, trust. <laughs> Pretend like it's not even happening. But what, like I, happening. what I do know to be true, I'm, I'm just gonna put this out in the universe. Whatever mm -hmm. it is that will unfold in your life with the autobiography, with the new music, we as exactly. we are going to be receptive of it. We are going to receive it with open arms. We are going to <laughs> we are going to welcome you. We're going to hold and sustain you until yes. you get this project and oh. move on to next. So we are Thank here. You so much. Oh my God. Thank you so much, Sonia. I have cried. In these interviews, I've gave the ugly cry in the first one. I have learned to hold it back now, but I appreciate your words because you know that where two or, or more are gathered and two or more agree, that's where God is. So thank you. You and I agree on that. And I uh, love you so much for that. Love and you. I am going to give you the same blessings in return because I know you're probably working on great things for yourself. So I you got it. And all the fans, when they watch this, they have the same blessings that we just gave each other. Yes. Yes, yes, let's yes. agree on that. Yeah. Dawn, thank, thank you, you so, so much. much for carving My out to become like a dream come true for me. I think that after we, you know, end this conversation, I just want you to close your eyes. I just want you to feel the hug that I'm sending you because oh I don't, I'm gosh. the power, the power wow. that you have world over years. And even oh when we <laughs> you, we held on to whatever memories we had of you oh, so, Sonia, so stop much. It. <laughs> thank you Come on, honestly i'm so serious thank that you. is absolutely beautiful it is so beautiful i thank you so much from my heart i thank you i feel that i felt when you said that i felt the other the prayer but oh my gosh that that means the world because you said in the beginning that you could see that things were happening throughout you, you were putting things together and as fans you could see what I wanted was vindication all this time because I didn't have the power of the press to tell my story. And anytime I was with Lucy Pearl, it was like, they didn't want to talk about In Vogue. And rightfully so, I had a new group that I was in. Why do you want to talk about In Vogue? That was the yeah. past. So I never got a chance to vindicate myself and to tell my yeah. side of the story. And now I am, And but you're saying that you got it early on. Yeah, we you did. You can see this stuff was happening. So, oh my God, yeah, I, I am so, thankful to you for your words and for your sincerity your sincerity you're so sincere and i feel that and i thank you so much and i will uh, when i hang up this phone that is what i'm gonna turn yeah i'm gonna be quiet for a minute because i have to take this in god has been blessing me over and over and over i don't have anything more than i had before financially but i'm still i'm feeling like Everybody is coming together to lift me up i cannot explain that um so thank you it's oh, a rebirth. Thank you, Dawn. So it's a thank rebirth. you. Thank you it's so much. Thank yes, you. Sir. And you understand the universe. You understand even more about what that means. You know what yes. I mean? Yes. Oh my God. Oh wow. Yeah, I got take goosebumps. Thank you so much. You take care as well. Bless you. We'll keep in touch because I want to talk to you about my book when it's done. Oh yes. Okay, yes. Dawn. Thank <laughs> All right, dear. Thank you, bye sweetie. Bye. Take care of yourself. Bye bye. There you have it. I think that that was an amazing interview. We spoke for, what was it, like two hours or something like that? That's how you really know. See my unmentionables. <laughs> That's how you really know when the conversation is organic. It was a pleasure. I'm telling you, having this conversation with Dawn Robinson from In Vogue and Lucy Pearl, I don't know how my eyes are holding up, but it does feel like a million ants are doing the electric slide <laughs> across my eyeballs. Pivotal moments, milestones in the celebrities' lives that I like to unpack and share with all of you, my sign on air, loyal listeners and viewers. Um, as I mentioned at the onset of this show, make sure that you subscribe and download, share all sign on air streaming platforms on YouTube. Spotify, iTunes, iHeartRadio, um, Amazon Music, Google Podcasts, and Buzzsprout. Make sure that you visit my website, www.sanyaonair.com. Damn it, why don't you cash at me too? Dollar sign, Sonya Hudson. And guess what? I, I, I just launched new merch. 
I'm going to put the website for my new merch. It's called The Empowerment Apparel. I'm going to put the, the link down in the uh, description section. So make sure that you head on over to my apparel line and choose yourself some sign on air and power apparel. I believe that clothing is a statement. Why not let your clothing speak for you? Once again, a special thank you to today's celebrity guest, um, Dawn Robinson, founding member of In Vogue and also Lucy Pearl. I am on pins and needles waiting for new music and also to her autobiography. Once those two things come out, I'm going to have Dawn back on the show. It has been a pleasure spending the last two hours with you. I love you so much for tuning in. Smooches off.